things. Other in kind. It's a name signifying what it is. What is a dog? The students will usually answer, it's an animal, right? Okay. Now, animal there is an example of a genus, right? It's a name said with one meaning of many things other than kind, like dog, cat, horse, dog, right? It signifies what it fits, right? Okay. It signifies it in a very what, general way we say in English, right? Mm -hmm. The word general is etymologically related to the word genus, right? Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, again, why do we tend to start with the genus? Because we know first we're confused. Yeah. 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 Whereas the genus represents a confused understanding of what the thing is, right? Confused because it's understanding what it is in common with many other things. And therefore it's not distinguishing one of those kinds from another, is it? Okay. I ask students, what is a sonnet? And they'll say it's a poem, right? Mm -hmm. okay. But the sonnet is only one what kind of poem, or many other kinds of poems have like the sonnet. Huh? I ask somebody, what is a tragedy or a comedy? What are they going to say? Yeah, it's a play or a drama, right? Okay. A play or drama, this example again would be genius, right? Okay. Um, when I say reason is an ability, right? Well, no. The only ability, there are many different kinds of ability than that, right? And reason may be a very important one, but it's still, you know, one of many <laughs> abilities we have. So name said with one meaning of many things other than kind signifying what it is, huh? And I think we can give myself room here for the system for our Now, the second name we talk about is the name of one of these particular things that are in the genus, right? Okay. Now, the Greek word they use for that is eidos, right? And the Latin word they use is what? Species, huh? And both eidos in Greek and species in Latin, they have the sense of a form, but of a form you can, what, see. Eidos is related to the Greek word identi, mean to see, right? And species is related to the word speculatum, speculation, mm. specular, to look, right? So it's the form or shape you see, huh? In English, we tend to borrow either the Latin word species, right? Or sometimes we simply use the word what? Form in Latin, in English, right? Okay. So species is the one that we use in logic. So species is the name of a particular kind of thing. under a genus. Huh? Okay. <clears throat> so if the, the genus is animal, then cat and dog and horse and elephant would be what? Species, right? Species is one of those funny words that is spelled the same way, I guess, in the singular and the plural. <laughs> okay. 
um, if the genus is what like government, right, then maybe monarchy and oligarchy and democracy and so on would be different species of what government, right? Then, okay. but in English you might speak of them as to be forms of what government, right? Okay. If play or drama is the genus, maybe tragedy and comedy are the species, right? Maybe there's a, another species in between tragedy and comedy. <laughs> um, if quadrilateral is the genus, then square and oblong and rhombus and rhomboid, right? And herpetium uh, are the species under that genus, right? The names of the species, huh? the forms of quadrilateral. As long as you don't have a name, like square, um, but you could say, in that case, you use a speech in place of the name. You might say that equilateral triangle and isosceles triangle and scalene triangle are the species of what? Triangle, right? Okay. You don't have a name for an equilateral triangle. Um, virtue and vice are names of species under the genus what? Habit. Habit, okay. Good habit and bad habit. So on. Now, very often, you find that two is not enough, right? I think Aristotle points this out in the first book of natural philosophy. Um, in our language is a sign of that, huh? Three is the first number about which we say all. Now, if you think about these two names, can you see the need for a third name? Yes, because the, yeah. the species is, yeah. is more particular than a genus, but it doesn't say. The what genus it doesn't is tell you what distinctly what the species is, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So if I ask you, what is democracy? And you see, what's well, a form of government, right? Well, so is, you know, oligarchy, so is monarchy, right? Okay. If I ask you, what is, you know, a uh, tragedy, you see, what's a play, right? Or a drama. So it's so's comedy, right? Yeah. So there's something in the species in addition to the, what, genus, right? Mm -hmm. And you need a name to bring out what the species has in addition to the what? Genus, right? Okay. Or since these uh, species are things other than kind, you need a name that would uh, signify what distinguishes one from the other, what separates one from the other, right? Okay. And so this is the third name, which is appropriately called difference. Uh, sometimes they call more explicitly uh, species making difference, right? Okay. But usually just talk for sure the difference. Huh? Species making difference. Now, Porphyry gives, um, when he gets to the species making difference, he gives actually three, uh, in a way, definitions of difference, right? But two of them are in terms of the role of difference, right? The role of difference in defining a species and the role of difference in separating one species from another. Okay. So as you can see in the text there, um, you know, say the difference is the name of what the species has in addition to the genus, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the species is the name of what separates one species from another species under the same genus. Okay. But those two definitions are of um, difference 
in terms of its function in defining something, right? And its um, function or use in dividing a genus into species, separating species. Okay. So, <clears throat> but if you stop and think about it, it's going to be the same name that separates one species from another that is also used to what? To find a species, huh? Okay. Take again the simple example there. Um, take the genus Quadrilateral, right, huh? Well, equilateral, say, or right angle, then, these are names of what some of the species of quadrilateral have in addition to being four sided, right? Some of them, in addition to being four sided, have those four sides, what, equal, right? Some don't, right? Okay. Some of them, um, in addition to being four sided, they have those sides being at right angles. And some do not, right? Then. So right angled is both the name of something that, let's say, the square and the oblong have in addition to being quadrilateral. But right angled also separates square and oblong from rhombus and rhomboid and even trapezium. Huh? Okay. Likewise, um, equilateral, right, are something that square and rhombus have in common, right? The rhombus is like a square that's been jerked, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not right angled, but it's still equilateral. Take to the square. Mm -hmm. And um, why the rhomboid is, is what, like a, an oblong that's been what? Jerked, right? Mm -hmm. The way I remember that mnemonically is the rhombus an S. An S is the first letter in square. Mm. <laughs> so the rhombus is like the square. And they, yeah. and that's how I remember. But the rhombus um, equilateral separates the square and the rhombus. Huh? From the oblong and the rhomboid. Huh? And from the trapezium uh, too. See? Okay. So the same name that is a name of what the square and the rhombus have in common, or in addition to the quadrilateral, right, is also a name that separates the square and the rhombus from the other what? Yeah, the other species of quadrilateral, right? Okay. So he looks at both the use of the difference in defining, right? Because in order to complete the definition of square, you've got to add to the genus what square has in addition to being quadrilateral, right? Mm -hmm. And that's both equilateral and right angle, right? Mm -hmm. But he also speaks of its use in dividing the genus into species, huh? mm -hmm. okay? And um, actually, the word difference is using the Latin word, right? The Greek word is etymologically the same. The Greek word is diaphora. But they come from pharaoh or fora, which means to carry, <laughs> and dia, which means apart. So when you say quadrilateral, all these things seem to be what together, right? And then the difference what, carries them apart huh? and separates them, right? <laughs> you know, equilateral separates square and rhombus from the other three, right? And then you know, quite, uh, right angle separates, you know, oblong and square from the rest, right? And the combination, as we saw, of, of like equilateral and right angle separates the square from all the rest, right? Huh? Okay? So, it's in fact the same name that separates species under the, what, same genus, right? And it is also the name of what that, those species have in addition to the genus, right? So it's both the name is going to be used to complete the definition, right? And the name is going to be used to divide a genus into its species. Okay. You can see that you could, right? This is the difference, huh? Both to complete the definition of things like square, right? But also to divide quadrilateral into the various kinds of quadrilateral.
but then uh, Porphyry gives a definition of difference going back to what we're dividing here, right? Okay. And he says that it's a name said with one meaning of many things other in kind, but signifying, instead of what it is, signifying how they are what they are. Okay. It's important to see that it signifies how rather than what, right? But you have to add, it signifies how they are what they are. Because it's an essential difference, huh? Okay. In the very nature of the things, what they are. As opposed to just a how by itself, it might be something accidental, like, how are you today? Well, I'm well today, or I'm sick today, or anything like that, right? But um, this is how they are, what they are. Okay. So it would be the same, have the same definition as genus, except for the last part. Huh? Instead of signifying what it is, it signifies how. Now, Porphyry is not yet here in, in the following yet, but not yet given a definition of species as a name said to live of many things, right? And we'll see the reason for that later on. <laughs> okay. After we discuss how the same thing can be both the genus and the species. <laughs> it's really only what they call the lowest species, but that's the Consider things before we see that. So you have the definition there of difference and of genus as names said to typically of many things, right? Signifying something, the nature, but the one signifies in a general way what they are, and the other signifies how they are, what they are. Okay? Now, as we go on here, right, you can see how those three names are very important for talking about definition. Because the species is the name of what is being defined. And the genus and the differences are names, right? Used to define. Okay? But the first and most basic name is the genus, right? Then you have to add usually two or more differences, right? To complete the definition. So we've, we've separated here, right? The name of the thing being defined, which is called the species, you're always defining a species, a particular kind of thing, right? And the name that begins the definition, and the name that completes the definition. Okay? This is what we said before, we have to now define what a name is, right? We have to distinguish between the name of the thing being defined, and the names used in the definition, right? And even among the names used in the definition between the what? Genus and the difference and the order among them, that the genus is really the fundamental name, right? Mm -hmm. And the difference is determined how huh? it is what it is. Huh? Okay. Any question about that? Those three names. Huh? Now, since the other name, said you didn't give anything, signifies something outside the nature, right? Outside what the thing is. It might seem superfluous to uh, subdivide those names, right? Because the definition is to say what the thing is, right? Okay. But there is a reason for subdividing those other names. Even as regards definition, but also as regards later on demonstration, and you see that once we subdivide those names. Okay, let me the questions again here. Name said with one meaning. Uh, 
many things, signifying something, we divide into two, inside their nature, and outside their nature. We subdivided inside of nature into three, right? The genus, the species, and the what, different types. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, the outside of their nature, they divide into two. And again, by a complete division, huh? either something that is connected with the nature and follows upon the nature, like an effect follows upon the thoughts, right? Mm -hmm. Or something that is not connected to nature and doesn't follow upon it then. So, we could say either it follows upon the nature or it does not follow upon the nature. And the first is called in logic a property. In Greek, the Greek word is idiosa. And it does not follow upon the nature, they call that an accident, huh? in Greeks and Bebekas. But both in Greek and Latin it has the, the word for happening, right? Huh? Yes, they call that an accident. Now when Porphyry defines property, He'll define property in the strictest and fullest sense, right? And that's the property that belongs to only one species, right? Mm -hmm. To every member of that species and always. Okay? So it belongs to only one species to every member and always. Huh? Okay. But you can use the word property in a less full sense, providing still its connection with the nature. Okay. Now most properties, it's hard to find one name for them. Usually you have to use a speech. Huh? The, the standard textbook uh, example of one name is that man is visible. <laughs> and that means that man is what? subject to laughter right now. And this is not the nature of man, but follows upon his nature. Because he's an animal, he can make the sounds of laughter, but because he has reason, he can see the absurdity of something that makes him laugh. Mm. Okay. But usually, um, we lack a name for most properties, and we have to fall back upon a, what, a speech, right? Okay. It's still a function like that. Okay. So, um, it's a property, for example, the number two to be what? Half of four, right? Mm -hmm. A half of four is expressing the relation of two to four, right? It's not what two is, but something followed upon two. Huh? Mm -hmm. Now, it's because it's two, it's half of what? Four, in a third of six, in a fourth of an eight. Okay? But all these things are following upon as being two, right? Mm -hmm. now, to be half of four is a property of two in the strict sense that belongs to only the number two. No other number is half of what? Four. And every two whatsoever is half of four. And a two is always half of four, right? Okay. Now, if you said that two is, let's say, less than five, then that would be connected with the nature also of two, right? Mm -hmm. It belongs to every two to be less than five, mm -hmm. and two is always less than five, but not only is two less than five, I mean four or two, right? Mm -hmm. But still we classify as a property because it seems to be what? Connected with the nature, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. The most common example in geometry of a property is that the triangle 
has its interior angles equal to what? Yeah. And that belongs to every triangle, and always, right? But as you learn geometry more, you realize it belongs only to the triangle. If you have another side, you're going to have more than Because we have a, let's say, quadrilateral, you can always what, divide that into two triangles, we end up with uh, more right angles, huh? Okay? Then just uh, two. So, to have the interior angles, you can two right angles, belongs to only the triangle, to every triangle, and always. Huh? Okay. Um, now, if you say it's a property of man to be a magician, well, man is the only animal that is a magician. <laughs> but it doesn't belong to what? Every man to be a magician, and even those strange ones who are, <laughs> they were not always magicians, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yet we classify that as a property, right? Because to be a magician is tied to the nature of man as an animal with reason, right? Okay. It involves both his animal nature, that's where we have these sensible sounds, we're talking about words, right? Vocal sounds. But obviously it's tied with the fact that he has reason, huh? But now, if you say of the triangle, or the square, or the pentagon, that it's green, right? Can you see any connection between the nature of triangle and being green? Or is that something that achieved, <laughs> happens? <laughs> okay. And life is in for a man to be white, huh? Is there a connection between uh, nature of man as an animal with reason that he should be white? I don't think so. Okay. So this seems to be something accidental, right? So this is the magician's contribution to good <laughs> racial harmony, right? <laughs> Did we say before that rational um, is a property? Well, yeah. Now, this is this is the question that we want to ask. Um, why do we go into a subdivision of names signifying something outside the nature? We're interested in definition, right? Well, as the text explains, for two reasons, right? Because the property, right, has a connection with the nature then it has a twofold relevance definition. Sometimes if you don't know the difference, right, but you know the property, you can reason from the property back to the difference. Reasoning is a word from an effect back to its cause. So the property can be a, a middle term, as we see in logic, a beginning for reasoning towards the difference, right? But secondly, if you don't know the difference, you can use the property in place of the difference. This gives you an imperfect, right, <laughs> definition, but something that might be what separate the thing you're trying to define. Okay. And suppose someone said to me, define dog and cat, let's say, right? Okay. And I said, well, dog is an animal. So so it's a cat. Well, dog is a four footed animal. Well, so is a cat. <laughs> Separates from the chicken, maybe, or the man, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, at this point, my ignorance is going to show up, right? So finally, I say, a dog is a four-footed animal that barks, <laughs> and a cat is a four-footed animal that meows. Huh? Okay. Now, um, I'm not sure, maybe, that the dog is the only animal that barks. Even if the dog were the only animal that barks, or the cat was the only animal that meows, huh? Would barking and meowing be the species making difference of these two animals? Okay. In other words, is he a dog because he barks, <laughs> or does he bark because he's a dog? Well, if he barks because he's a dog, then barks is really like a what? Property following upon his nature as a dog. But because I'm too ignorant to see the essential difference between the dog and the cat, right? 
by the barking and the meowing, you know, strike my senses, right? Rather than be completely ignorant of the difference, you know, between the dog and the cat, I say the one is a four-foot animal that barks, and the other a four-foot animal that what? Meows, right? Huh? You see that? So th there's a two reasons then why even with a view to definition, huh, we want to see the distinction between these two names. <coughs> you see? The accident, the accident is useless, right? Both for defining even imperfectly something, and for investigating the essential differences. Huh? But the property can be useful as a starting point, right? To look for the difference, right? And if you don't have a difference, or before you have the difference, it can be used in place of the difference to give you a speech that's imperfect, but something like a definition. Okay? Uh, sometimes Aristotle will call that a perigraphe or a circle, right? Then. Okay? Um, it's like if I didn't know, you know, it made two to be two, and I say, well, it's a number half of four. <laughs> well, number half of four and, and two are convertible, right? So it would separate two from everything else. Huh? Now, if you look at the Nicomachean Ethics, huh, when Aristotle sees the need to take up human virtue, when he first speaks of human virtue as a praiseworthy quality, right? Okay? And human vice as a blameworthy, right? quality. Well, there he's giving more the property than the difference, right? Because praiseworthy is something connected with what the virtue is, but it's not what really makes it to be virtue, right? Mm -hmm. It's praiseworthy because it is a virtue. <laughs> and vice is blameworthy because it is a vice, right? But what is the difference, right? And it's not until the second book of the Martin Ethics that he starts to bring out what the real difference is. Huh? But the fact that he knows that virtue is a praiseworthy quality, right, is a starting point for investigating the what, essential difference. Huh? What is it that is praised, let's say, in, in eating, let's say, in drinking, right? Say, well, the man who eats and drinks the right amount for himself in the circumstances, right, that's praiseworthy, right? Huh? But if he eats too much or drinks too much for himself in the circumstances, right, or, or not enough, maybe, right? He's classing the job and so on, right? Uh, then this is what? Blameworthy, right? Huh? Well, then you're starting to reason out that virtue is a praiseworthy quality. What is praised is the middle, right? Okay? The reasonable middle. And you're starting to see more essentially what virtue is. Huh? So you start to reason your way in to the property, right? So, um, but notice, huh? The little child who doesn't yet see the intrinsic goodness or badness of things, right? But they know certain things that they are frowned upon for doing, right? And other things that they are applauded for doing, right? Okay. So, um, when we have the definition man is a rational animal, do we use the property because we don't know the specific things? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, in, in a sense, you know, um, in a way, we're trying to get at what's in the nature of man, whereby he has the ability called reason, right? Okay. So, uh, that's why we tend to have what, just one difference there, right? But it's really a property, right? the property makes sense. Yeah. And it gets us farther than the cover the five <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. But interesting, even in the metaphysics, Aristotle often refers to man as just simply a two-footed animal, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> <clears throat> now, if you stop and think about these five names, right, in reference to definition, you can see there's something very complete about these five names. Huh? Species is the name of what is being defined, right? Genus is the name that begins the definition, right? Difference is the name that is used to complete the definition or a perfect definition. Mm -hmm. Property is the name that's useful for completing an imperfect definition or for investigating, right? And accident is the name that is useless both for naming and defining. Mm -hmm. See how complete that is, right? Huh? Huh? We want to separate and distinguish the name 
of the thing being defined from the name it's used in the definition, right? And they are mainly the genus and the difference, right? But then the property has some usefulness for investigating the differences and for being used in place of them for any of the definition. But we also separate the name that is useless, right? Green is useless for what? Naming triangle and useless for what? Defining it and investigating definition triangle. They get nowhere using green. Nowhere in geometry will green appear, right? <laughs> Now, as Porphyry says, uh, these names are useful um, also for dividing, right? Especially for dividing a genus into a species by its what, differences, right? But if you didn't know its what, differences, right? You might use divide by its properties, right? It's also useful, he says, for demonstration. A demonstration is we'll find out when we get into the logic of the third act. In a demonstration, you show that a property belongs to a species through an understanding of its nature, its genus and differences. So we demonstrate, for example, in geometry, that a triangle has its interior angle is equal to two right angles. We demonstrate a property of a species through an understanding of the nature of that species that involves the genus and differences. Okay. Okay. So the uh, the book of the five names, as they call it, uh, the five vocal sounds, the book of the five vocal sounds, five names, and uh, um, It's useful for definition, for division, for demonstration, and also we'll find out for that book of Aristotle is called the categories. <laughs> okay, let's see what that's about later on. So it's quite a thing he did, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I know it's Thomas Aquinas there in, in the Summa Contra Gentiles, in the first uh, volume there, where he uh, has a chapter showing that no name is said univocally of God and creatures. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. There are some names that are said of God and creatures but equivocally by reason, yeah. Mm -hmm. But no name is said of God and creatures inimically. And Thomas gives many arguments to show this. Huh? Well, one argument is an either or argument. Huh? He says every name said inimically of two things, it's either their genus or their species or their difference or their property or their accident. Huh? Mm -hmm. And then he eliminates all, each one of those individually. Mm -hmm. And then he concludes that no name therefore mm -hmm. is said inimically of God and creatures. Mm -hmm. So he's going all the way back to what? The first book of logic, right? the isagoge of Porphyry, right? And, you know, in terms of, of faith and reason to this book, they are interesting, because I can see Thomas here in the highest part of, of our knowledge there, uh, reason out knowledge and theology. He's using, right, this, right? Yeah. Albert the Great, his teacher, writes a paraphrase of this, Kajitan, the cardinal that the church sent up to mm -hmm. talk to Martin Luther. <laughs> he has a commentary on the isagoge, right? Marvelous thing, huh? and uh, and the Mohammedans, of course, use this. Huh? The later Greek philosophers, but Porphyry was violently anti-Christian, mm. and and uh, Augustine, you know, talks about this, right? Now the Christian emperors burnt his anti-Christian books, and we don't have them, right? <laughs> but uh, Augustine, I think, in the City of God, if I remember right, he speculates as to why Porphyry was, you know, whether it was pride or something, right? No. So, but despite uh, the disagreement between, you know, Porphyry about religion and, and the Christians, obviously, right, but even the Mohammedans, right, mm -hmm. they all took this book, the Isagoge, right, mm -hmm. as common, what, teaching, right? Mm -hmm. okay. And of course, it really grows out of what you can see people doing naturally. When I go into class and I say to students, what is a dog? They'll say, an animal. They'll naturally give it the genus, right? Mm -hmm. I go into love and friendship and I say, what is love? And they say, well, it's emotion. Well, one kind of love yeah. <laughs> is an emotion. But I say, so is anger, so is fear. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> then they actually get the genus, and they've got to add what? Differences, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. See? So this is something really common to us, and it's natural, whether you're a pagan, like maybe Porphyry was, right? Or a Christian, like Thomas Aquinas, or Albert the Great, right? Or Kajitan, or even a Mohammedan, or Islamic, you know? 
or even you know, one of the later Greek philosophers who might not be a Christian, right? But they all take this as the fundamental word. And it's called, as they say in Greek, you know, the isagoge of Aristotle's categories, but for short, it's called isagoge, the introduction, mm-hmm. <laughs> and eventually it started to be used by, by Antonio Masia, is the introduction, not into logic, but to the whole philosophy of the world. Mm-hmm. Because you're defining and dividing and demonstrating. Mm-hmm. That's a yeah. good philosophy, define, divide, and demonstrate, really. But that's, that's the three Ds there, right, in English. Mm-hmm. Define, divide, and demonstrate. And these are part of for that. Right? Understand definition. So think about those five names then in comparison to definition. How complete that is, right? Mm-hmm. The, the separating and distinguishing and defining the name of the thing being defined as opposed to the names used in the definition. Mm-hmm. And you're distinguishing between the name that begins the definition and the names that complete the definition, and between the names that complete it perfectly and imperfectly, and Always being distinguished from the names that are useless mm-hmm. for naming a thing or for what? Defining it or for investigating a definition, right? So, um, maybe you're surprised how many philosophers don't know the Isagoge, right? Some, you know, some even haven't even heard the name of the Isagoge. <laughs> Others have heard the name, but they never read the book. <laughs> and uh, you know the Isagoge out of TC, didn't you? So, Porphyry would define all these and then he'll you know, compare them, you know, on what they have in common and so on. Right? So, any questions up to where we are now? Notice that the definition of genus has a genus, right? What's a, so it's a genus of a, a, a genus. A name. A name, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> name. And you have these differences, right? Said of, with one meaning, right? Mm-hmm. Of many things, mm-hmm. other in kind, signifying what it is. Mm-hmm. Those are all differences, right? Mm-hmm. The genus of all five of these is name, right? Name said with one meaning. <laughs> It's common to them. We break, we need, uh, not, not, not to fall Say the genus is that which is said of many other species signifying, you know, what it is. And so it kind of left up in the air whether you're talking about the name genus, right? Or the general kind of thing signified by it, right? And I think that the word genus and, say, species are equivocal by reason, right? Because sometimes you use the word genus to mean the name of a general kind of thing, and species the name of a particular kind of thing, and sometimes you use the word genus to mean the general kind of thing, and species to mean the particular kind of thing. So when you're dividing a genus into species, I think you're dividing a general kind of thing into the particular kinds of that thing. You're not dividing a name into names, right? Okay. But because the definition is composed of names, huh? and when we ask for a definition, we, we use a name, that's why we distinguish the names here. Okay. Now, sometimes you use the word genus and, and, and uh, difference even when you have a name that's equivocal by reason, right? But that's a little bit different, right? A little different meaning of the word, a looser use of the word genus, huh? So when you first distinguish these five names, we're taking them in the strict sense, huh? Where each of them is a name said with one meaning of many things. Okay. Now I might make a little footnote here about the difference between logic and what um, grammar. Huh? Okay. Now take this example: green triangle and equilateral triangle. Now, the grammatical analysis of the phrase green triangle and equilateral triangle would be exactly the same. 
The grammarian would say, triangle here is a noun, right? And green or equilateral is an adjective mm-hmm. modifying triangle. Bang, that's as far as it goes. Mm-hmm. There's no difference between those two from a grammatical point of view, is there? Mm-hmm. Okay. Now the magician comes on the scene, right? And he says, there is an enormous difference, right? <laughs> Triangle here can be taken as a genus or a species, right? Green is a what? Accident, Accident right? Huh? But equilateral is a species making what? Uh, difference. Oh, difference. Oh, yeah, yeah. yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, see, the magician would ask, you know, what is a triangle? Huh? A triangle is a plane figure contained by three straight lines. Now, is green one way of being three sided? No, nothing to do with three sides at all, right? But equilateral is one way the three sides can be, right? Isosceles is another way, right? Where just two of them are equal. And scalene, where none of them are equal, right? Okay. So scalene, isosceles, and equilateral, they determine three different ways of being, what? Three sided. You know? Green or red, white, and blue might sound patriotic, but it's nothing to do with being three sided. You know? genus or the species for that matter, more by noun, right? Huh? And the accident, or even the difference, by an adjective, right? Because the difference does signify how it is what it is, right? Okay? And we're more apt to signify how by an adjective than by a what? Noun, right? Okay. Now, another thing that we've uh, touched upon that come back to here um, in a definition, can there be more than one genus? No. No. Okay. If there was more than one genus in a definition, you wouldn't be talking about what? one thing. One thing, right? Yeah, okay. okay. But there is usually, if not always, more than one what? Difference, yeah. right? Okay. Now, if you read the dialogue called the Mino, right? Um, when Mino tries to eventually define virtue, huh? um, and then Socrates examines the definition, right? And Socrates makes you know one critique of the definition. But when I first hear the definition, he defines virtue something like this: the desire for good things and the ability to achieve them. Mm-hmm. Sounds pretty. Impressive, right? Huh? <clears throat> but when I examine that, it seems to me that he has two what? Genera, right? It's a plural genus, huh? The desire for good things and the ability to what? Oh, yeah. Achieve them, right? Yeah. Is the desire for good things and the ability to achieve them, are those the same? Yeah. No. And couldn't a man have a desire for good things without the ability to achieve them? Mm-hmm. Or vice versa, he could have maybe the ability to achieve good things, but not what? Desire them, right? Yeah. So you're really talking about two different things, right? Mm-hmm. The desire, right? And the ability, right? If I desire money, right? I may not have the ability to get money, right? Or someone else might have the ability to get money, but not desire it. Huh? The famous anecdote about Thales, right? One year he decided to show he could make money. <laughs> Just to show that a philosopher could make money if you wanted to, right? <laughs> we certainly interested in that, right? <laughs> okay? So if I got a gun, I got the ability to get money, right? But maybe not the desire to get money that way anyway. <laughs> someone else doesn't have, has the desire to get money, doesn't have the gun, so they don't have the ability to get the money, right? And two different things, see? So, really, um, that's kind of the first criticism I might make of Eno's definition, right? So there should be only one genus and what? Many differences, right? That's an interesting difference there, right? Okay. When Aristotle defines um, a tragedy, right? The genus is what? Imitation or likeness, right? 
it's the likeness of an action that is serious, etc., right? And then Dhani says, act it out, right? So there are many differences, right? That's the likeness of something serious that has in common with epic, that it's acted out, it has in common with comedy, right? But the two differences there are separated from both epic and comedy. Um, but there's just one genus. Huh? Now, a second difference here you might find out, point out between logic here and um, grammar, right? Um, in English, we tend to put the what adjective before yeah. the noun, right? Yeah. Okay. So if the genus is signified by a noun, yeah, and the difference by an adjective, the difference will be given before the genus, right? Mm -hmm. So when we say that the genus is the first word in the definition, what does that mean? Should that be understood grammatically? Yeah, first in our understanding of the thing, right? Okay. And unless you understood the genus first, you wouldn't really see why these are differences, right? Unless they understood, let's say, what a quadrilateral is, right? I wouldn't see how equilateral or right angle there are differences of quadrilateral. Unless I understood what a triangle is, I wouldn't see how equilateral and isosceles and scaling are differences of triangle by red, white, and blue are not. Okay. Red, white, and blue are not three ways of being three-sided. But equilateral, isosceles, and scaling are. Right? So unless you really understand uh, the genus, right, you don't understand the differences. Huh? When Aristotle talks about tragedy and comedy and epic, um, he points out that each of these um, are a likeness, right? An imitation. And therefore they can differ by that in which they imitate, or what they imitate, and so on, right? But you wouldn't see those as being the sources of differences unless you saw in general that it is a what? Uh, likeness or imitation. So, um, the genus, when we say it's the first word in the definition, we don't mean that it's the first word in necessary in, in a language like English, for example. When you write it out grammatically, right? Huh? You say, okay. So if I say in English that a triangle, excuse me, a square is an equilateral and right angle and quadrilateral, right? Quadrilateral is the last word in the sentence, right? In the speech, right? I say the definition of square is equilateral and right angle quadrilateral. But nevertheless, quadrilateral is the first in our what? understanding, as the logic is concerned with, right? Okay. Um, but maybe in Latin or in Greek, you could put the what? adjective after the noun, right? Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, you can you know, play around with this in English, you could you know, do with the phrase, right? I say man is an animal, what? With reason. <laughs> there I get the genus first, right? But if I use the adjective instead of with reason, I said man is a rational animal, right? I'd have to put, because the English grammar, rational before animal. Mm -hmm. So I'm writing to say man is an animal rational. <laughs> I seem to have to say man is a rational animal, right? Even in my time, I can say animal rationalities or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the grammatical order is not logical order, right? Okay. And it doesn't mean you have to, you know, go against the grammatic order by using phrases, you know. Mm -hmm. But you know, understand you have to, right? So like when I was explaining the definition of name there, I begin with it's a sound, right? And then I add it's a vocal sound. It's a vocal sound that signifies a custom. And then, you know, no part of which signifies by itself, right? But I start with the word that, logically speaking, is before the rest, right? Okay. As they say, when you ask the child there, you know, when you ask a you know, class of students, what is it to be called a class of students out of the blue? Say, what's a dog? They'll begin by saying, animal. They won't begin with four-footed. <laughs> you see? They'll say animal first, right? Okay. 
So even though later on they might say four-footed animal, <laughs> they didn't what? Think first of four-footed, right? They thought of it being an animal. Okay? Or if they were, you know, thinking of tragedy and comedy, they say it's a play, right? You know, well, they wouldn't use four-footed or two-footed to separate one play from another, as Aristotle would say. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Now, we come to a nice subtlety here now, at the bottom of page 12. Huh? Can the same name be both a genus and a species? And the answer to that question is going to be yes. Okay? Species as we define it. But in order to understand that answer, I distinguish between two kinds of distinction <laughs> that you find in sciences. And one we could call an absolute distinction, and the other a what? Relative distinction, right? Because absolute means in itself or by itself, right? And relative means what? Towards another, right? Okay. So I give a number of examples of this distinction, right? Between two distinctions. Um, the distinction in human being between a man and a woman is a what? Absolute distinction. A man cannot be a woman, and a woman cannot be a man. Okay? But what about the distinction between a father and a son? Okay. Well, the same man can be a father and a son, but in relation to different what? People, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. But you can't be a man with reference to one and a woman with reference to somebody else. Okay? You're either a man or a woman, right? Okay. Or take numbers, right? The distinction between an odd number and an even number is what? Yeah. You're either an odd number or an even number, huh? A number. One of the two. But double and half is what? Yeah. It's possible for a number like four to be both what? Double and half, but in comparison to different things, right? Okay. So is the distinction between genus and species, as we define them, right? Is that an absolute distinction of names, or is it a relative distinction of names? It's relative, huh? Okay. So that the same name would be a genus in comparison to these, and a species in comparison to those. Take our stock example, quadrilateral, right? Well, if you compare a quadrilateral to a uh, rectilineal, plane figure, plane figure contained by straight lines, quadrilateral is a what? Species. Species, right? Along with trilateral or triangle, right? Okay. And pentagon and so on, right? But quadrilateral in comparison to square and rhombus and oblong and so on is a what? Genus, right? Okay. You see that? I know it's relative here, it doesn't mean that this thing is subjective or <laughs> not precise or not certain, right? The two is half of four is very certain, right? Mm -hmm. And the quadrilateral is a genus of square is very certain. Very precise, right? It's a species of working figure. But well, it's a different distinction, right? Mm -hmm. um, than an absolute distinction. Huh? Okay. I am really the son of Reno Victor Berkowitz, right? But I'm really the father of Paul Berkowitz. Huh? Mm -hmm. so, so I'm both a father and a son, but not towards the same man. Huh? Now, <coughs> This is a uh, similar thing. Once you see this, then arises kind of the kind of ultimate questions, <laughs> and um, this happens in other areas too, right? If you realize that the same man can be both a father and a son, you might go on and ask: Now, is every son also a father, and is every father a son, right? 
and there are some sons who are not fathers, as we know, right? Okay. Is there a father who's not a son? Right. But we're told about Adam, right? Right? Okay. And uh, so Adam is a father, but not a what? Son. I mean, I'm not, you know, he doesn't have a father like you and I have a father, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But notice uh, that may be hard to know. Is there a father, right, who's not a son, right? Okay. We might know that there's a son who's not a father, right? But uh, I'm not always sure. <laughs> but uh, uh, you had two questions, right? Looking at either end, right? Okay. Now take another example of this sort of thing. Can something be both a cause and an effect? Or is this an absolute distinction between cause and effect? The same thing can be a cause and an effect. Yeah, okay. Now you ask the question, though, but is every cause a what? An effect, right? And the answer that's eventually going to be no. <laughs> there's a cause that is not an effect, right? Maybe there's an effect that's not a cause at the other end. <laughs> okay? Now, um, take whole and part, right? Is that an absolute distinction, whole and part, or relative? Relative. Yeah. So, um, Massachusetts can be what? A part of New England, right? Okay. So New England is a whole, which Massachusetts is a part, but New England is a part of the United States, right? But again, Massachusetts has parts, you know, I live in Worcester County, right? So Worcester County is a part of, Worcester, of Massachusetts, which is a part of New England, right? So now you ask the ultimate question, right? Is there a part that's not a whole? <laughs> and vice versa, is the whole that's not a part? Now, in modern science, huh, in the 20th century, um, the physics of the 20th century is distinguished from that of the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th. In the first part of the century, there were two great things, right? One was the discovery of the quantum, right? And Max Planck in December of 1900, right? The dawn of the 20th century, he proposed the quantum hypothesis, right? It took about 30 years for quantum theory to be, which is full development, right? And then 1905, Einstein proposed the special theory of relativity, right? Which he followed later on with the general theory of relativity in 1915, right? After special relativity and quantum theory were somewhat perfected, these physicists went in opposite directions, huh? And the quantum physicists went in the direction of looking to see if there's a part that is not a what? Oh. oh. And so they're going from what? atomic physics, which quantum theory in a way completed, right, down to the study of the elementary particles, right? And they were, what, accelerating elementary particles and shooting them, right? And trying to split them, right? But they're trying to see if you come to a part that is what? Yeah, there's no longer a hole. <laughs> you see? A part that is not a hole, right? Okay. And, um... Which means it doesn't have parts. Oh, it's yeah. indivisible. Right? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. And they, they actually, for a while, they were trying with the idea that there's a minimum length in the universe. <laughs> minimum what? Minimum length in the universe. Oh, okay. which, yeah, yeah. So notice, without you know trying to say uh, what the conclusion will be, they're moving in the direction of looking for what? Of the part, right? Okay. And that would go on until you came to a part that was not a, a whole, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not saying there is such a thing, but. Now, Einstein, with the general theory of relativity, went in the opposite direction. He was, this is a starting point for kind of an explosion in the study of the cosmos as a whole, right? The general theory of relativity uh, led to a great, what, interest in cosmology, the study of the universe as a whole, right? Okay? And, you know, what came out of the attempts to understand the universe at first from the general theory of relativity, it appeared that the universe was, what, finite contrary to what the moderns have thought since the Renaissance. <laughs> Aristotle thought the universe was limited, right? 
Well, the first Greek philosophers thought it was infinite. Well, the first modern scientists thought the universe was infinite. And now with the general theory of relativity, it seemed that the universe was finite, limited. Mm -hmm. This was quite a shock to them. Mm -hmm. And um, Einstein himself, I guess, didn't fully realize the consequences of his own theory. <laughs> and it was leading this way, huh? Okay. But notice, if the universe is not finite, huh? if it's limited, if not infinite, then there is a hole that is not a what? Part. See, see? see, notice, the ultimate questions you might say, right? Are what? Following out, once you recognize that a whole can be a part and part of the whole, the ultimate question is, is there a whole that's not a part? And that takes you in the direction of the study of the cosmos, the universe as a whole, <laughs> and the other one down into what? The atom down towards what? Elementary particles, and that there are quarks, you know? Down that direction, right? And you're looking to see, is there a part that is not a whole? Kind of the ultimate question, right? But the most ultimate question is, is there a cause that is not a what? An effect, right? Which okay. um, has a similar question with the father and the son, right? In the same way with the mother, right? The same woman can be a mother and a daughter. Was there a daughter who's not a mother? I think there are daughters who are not mothers. But is there a mother who's not a daughter? What about Eve? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But notice now, huh? um, we're not assuming that any of these series, you know, are closed at either end, right? They might be open at both ends, for all we know. Give an example in geometry, right? Is there a, you could have one straight line be, let's say, half of another straight line, right? But is there a straight line that is half of some other straight line but not double some other line? When you get to study the continuous in book six of Aristotle's book, The Physics or Natural Hearing, as it's called in Greek, you find out that the continuous is divisible forever. So you can always bisect the straight line. So you never come to a straight line that is double and not what? Reading this half and not double, right? Okay. But again, if you can ex always in geometry extend the straight line, is there a line that's double of something but has no line that it's half of? Goes on forever, right? Okay. But now with numbers, right? Unless you're a crazy modern who thinks you can divide the one, right? <laughs> but the one is actually simpler than the point, it's indivisible. There's a number that is double. Like two, right? Huh? Okay. Or the number that's half, like three, right? Three is half of six, but is it double of anything? So three is a half that is not what? Double. By right, four is a half that is double, right? But now is there a number that's double but not half? So in the case of number, a uh, case of double and half, in numbers, right, there is a half that is not double, but there's no double that's not half. Mm -hmm. It's closed at one end, so to speak, not the other end. Mm -hmm. But in, in straight lines, there's no line that is it's open at, at either end, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, by father and son, without you know faith, right? Yeah. You might say, well, was, was our man who is not was a father but not a son, right? You know, but when you hear about Adam, he needs to be a father, right? Okay. So, we're going to ask a similar question here now. Logical question, right? <laughs> okay. Well, we ask it also when we reason, see? When we reason, we find out that the conclusion of one argument can be a premise in the next argument, right? So to be a conclusion or a premise is a relative distinction, right? So in Euclid, the conclusion of one theorem, right? is a premise for the next one, right? But is every premise a conclusion? No. In that case, you'd never know anything, right? Okay. So, <clears throat> we ask then, now, huh? quadrilateral is both a genus and a, what, species, right? Now we go in both directions. Does 
Does every genus of species, another way of putting it, does every genus have another genus above it, right? Perfect. Well, see, above rectilinear plane figure is what? Plane figure, right? Above plane figure is figure, right? Does that go on forever, right? That you, you always have a thought above every thought that you have. <laughs> and then vice versa, you know? Does every, what? Species have species below it, right? Or do you come eventually to what we would call a lowest species, huh? a species that has no species below it? In other words, a species that is not a what? Genus, right? Mm -hmm. And then the other question, the other, other end, right? Mm -hmm. Do you come to a genus that is not a species? Mm -hmm. A genus that has no genus above it? Do you come to what we might call a highest genus, right? This is where Aristotle comes on the scene with the categories. Eh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, you know, Isidoge and Aristotle use that for lesser lines, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. But he always takes the most difficult thing, right? Mm -hmm. Just like, you know, he points out about Euclid, right? He takes the most difficult case, mm -hmm. and he's an easier case for us, secondary minds, okay? So, um, are there species that are not in genera? Different kinds of square? No. Um, but how about oblong? Is oblong a lowest species? Are there different kinds of oblong? Different shapes in the earth? Yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah. See? So this oblong here. And this one here, they um, have exactly the same shape, do they, right? Yeah. But if you had an oblong, let's say, where the longer side is to the shorter side is two to one, maybe that's the lowest what? species, right? Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. How about triangle, right? Is triangle a lowest species? No. No? It has scales. But now, what about scaling, isosceles, and equilateral? Are any of those lowest? Yeah. What about equilateral triangle? Okay, that would be. Uh, they still have. Yeah, either bigger or smaller. Yeah. But that's not really a difference in, in, okay. in, in the figure, right? Okay. So all equilateral triangles have the same shape, right? Oh, oh yeah, okay. Sure. But not all isosceles triangles, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. right. So um, that's kind of interesting to see that in the species you get when dividing a genus, one of them might be a, already a lowest species, yeah. like square, but not oblong, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, a circle would seem to be a lowest species, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So you have to have different shapes of circle, right? Huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is man a lowest species? So, what would you say? Yes. See, so if, if you speak of man as an animal with reason, there are species of man, we have to have different kinds of reason, right? Mm. Now, the white man, and the black man, and the yellow man, and the red man have a different kind of reason, right? Mm. Uh, then you might argue that what man is a genus and not a what lowest species, right? Mm. But if red and black and so on are not different kind of reason, but they're really accidental differences, right? Mm. Then maybe man is a what lowest species, right? Mm. Okay. Now, it's not as easy to see that as it is that a circle is the lowest species, right? Mm -hmm. Okay? Some married men and women don't have the same... <laughs> don't think the same way. <laughs> but you know, I'm not sure that, that uh, you know, that you say that they really have a different kind of reason, right? Yeah. But, you know, it's more, more obscure with, than it is in math, right? With that, yeah. male and female, it doesn't mm -hmm. seem like... It seems more than an accident, though, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. That would it be like a problem? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a very difficult subject, right? Oh. <laughs> I'm saying the logician will explain what a lowest species is, right? Okay? It's a species that is... You give a definition of it now. See? And it's a name, right? You take the lowest species now as a name. It's a name said of many things, right? 
not other in kind, right? Instead of in individuals, right? Signifying what it is. Right? Like circle, for example, instead of many individual circles, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, I get the definition of low species here now. <coughs> I remember the, the definition of species we gave before was in comparison to the genus, right? Okay. If you look at what's below species, if that species is also genus, so then it's a genus with respect to what's below it. But if you come down to the lowest species, then it has a unique relation to what's below it. It's a name said with one meaning. of many individuals, huh? Not other in kind, huh? That's understood as individuals. Signifying what it is. So you take circle here. Instead of this circle and this circle and this circle, right? It's a name said with one meaning, right? The reason why I call this a circle is the same as the reason why I call this a circle and this a circle. Of many, what? Individuals, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Many that differ only as individuals, huh? Not differing in kind. Signify what it is. What is this? A circle. What is that? A circle. What is that? A circle, right? Okay. Now, if you compare the definition of difference and the definition of what? Genus, right? With the definition of lowest species. The definition of genus shares this with lowest species definition, right? Mm -hmm. But it differs here, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because the genus is said of many other in kind. Mm -hmm. The difference shares many other in kind with what? The definition of difference. Mm -hmm. But a difference can signify how they are what they are, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. There you see the idea that you need one one difference, right? To define these things, right? Even to define genus, difference, and lowest species. Genus, difference, and lowest species have in common that they're a name said with one meaning of many what? Things, huh? Okay? But the genus and species differ from difference because they signify what those many things are. Why difference signifies how they are what they are. But um, uh, genus differs from lowest species because it's said of many other in kind, and the lowest species is said only of many other individuals, right? Okay. And it has in common with difference that it's said of many other in kind. It differs by that. See? So you need, in a sense, both this and that, right? Okay. Just like you need the definition of genus this and other in kind. And in the definition of difference, other in kind, but how it is what it is, right? So the, the logician explains what a lowest species is, but he leads to the geometry to determine what is a lowest species in geometry. And you could maybe would tell you that the circle is a lowest species, and the trilateral triangle is a lowest species, and the square is, right? But maybe oblong is not, huh? and isosceles triangle is not. Huh? Maybe if you specify the oblong, what the ratio is, the longer to the shorter side, right? Mm -hmm. Like 2 to 1 or 3 to 1 or something. Mm -hmm. Then you have maybe a lowest species, right? Mm -hmm. okay. The mathematician would say that what? Even number and odd number is not a lowest species, but 7 is, right? Mm -hmm. okay. But prime and composite are both genera and species, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you leave now to the, what, biologist to say, you know, the natural philosopher, whether man is the lowest species, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And whether dog is, or are there different kinds of dog, right? Mm -hmm. You know? Okay. Um, and you leave to the, the poetic science, right? Is um, uh, comedy a lowest species, right? Or, I would say myself from my study of comedy that 
what I call the good-natured comedy and the satire are different forms of what comedy is. Mm-hmm. The good-natured comedy, I think, is much superior to the satire, right? Because mm-hmm. the, the good-natured comedy expels what melancholy, right? Mm-hmm. But the satire kind of <laughs> makes you what? Misanthrope, huh? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it, what they say about, about uh, Swift, right? You know, it kind of makes you melancholy reading Swift. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But even Shakespeare, he has the, the three good-natured comedies and they're much more enjoyable than the two satires, right? Uh-huh. You know, but uh, satire sometimes gets a little bit, you know, impressive. <laughs> See how okay. Shakespeare has a black satire, you know, which is impressive. It's a shock, you know, because Homeric heroes are not so heroic. Uh-huh. So, so, not so heroic. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. But, as I say, the logician then leaves, he explains what a lower species is, and he might exemplify it, but he really leaves to the other science to determine what that is. But in the other direction, then the logician, he's the, the master here, right? Okay. Is there a genus that is not a what? species, right? Or does every genus have a genus above it, right? Well, if every genus had a genus above it, you have to know the genus before you can know the species. You can know what a quadrilateral is without knowing what a square is, but you can't know what a square is without knowing a quadrilateral. Mm-hmm. So if every genus had a genus above it, how many genera would you have to know to know anything? Mm-hmm. Yeah. In which case, you'd know what? Nothing. <laughs> yeah. That's obviously not true, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. You couldn't even say you don't know anything. You would know what it is to know. Mm-hmm. Okay? And... Um, how many definitions would be presupposed to any definition? Mm-hmm. Infinity of definitions, right? So you wouldn't be able to do anything, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. And you couldn't begin even to define, right? Because mm-hmm. you have to define the genus before you could use the genus, right? You have to define the genus that, right? use that, mm-hmm. and even begin, right? Yeah? Okay. Um, another way, let me mention in the text, I don't know why not, but it should be. Um, if every genus had a genus above it, right? Then there'd always be a more universal name or universal word than any word you have, right? Mm-hmm. But there are most universal words. I take the word something or the word thing or the word being, right? Mm-hmm. Can there be something that is not a being? Huh? No. Can there be something that isn't something? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but but I mean, if it's a name, it's something, right? Yeah. Okay. So there can't really be something that isn't something, right? There can't really be something that's not a being, right? Okay. There can't be a thing that's not a thing. So there are most universal names, right? Like being and something and so on. Um, While if every genus had a genus above it, right, you'd never come to a most universal name, right? Okay. So this is one way, another way, right, I should say, that we show that what? Not every genus has a genus above it. The consequence of that is that there's no most universal name, well, there's, but there are most universal words and names, right? Therefore, not every genus has a genus above it, right? Okay. And the other way we show it is by the fact that you have to know the genus before you can know the species, right? And therefore you have to know an infinity of things before you can know anything. In which case you never know anything, right? And there'd be an infinity of definitions before any definition. So you never know anything by definition, right? Okay? So we know anything, right? So that's nothing to say. <laughs> Can't even say I don't know anything because he doesn't know what it is to know. The really? Mm-hmm. Doesn't really know. Mm-hmm. Nothing to say. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but now, the next step is key here now. Once you realize that there are most universal names, right? There's a name that's said of everything, like the word thing or something, right? Does that mean that there's one genus of everything, right? Well, if you go back to the definition of genus now, 
It's a name said with one meaning of many things of one kind signifying what it is, right? Well, the question is, are those most universal names, like being or thing or something, right? Are they names said with one meaning of everything? Or are they said with more than one meaning? Are they said univocally or equivocally? If they're said equivocally, then there isn't one highest genus, right? There's going to be more than one highest genus. If they are said univocally, then you're going to have one highest genus, right? Now, what Aristotle showed, and we're going to follow in this fact, is that those most universal names are not said univocally with the same meaning, that is. They're not said equally, right? Of everything. Therefore, there can't be one highest genus, right? Okay. But then you have to say, well, how do we distinguish then the many highest genera? <laughs> That's Aristotle's famous book, The Categories of Valor. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, I don't want to go further today, because I uh, tend to be just stop right there. Okay. And so we'll start with that question, you know. The follow up here of the realization that the same name can be a genus and a species, right? Mm -hmm. And that gives rise to two questions. Is there a species that is not a genus, right? Or is there any species? Right? And then the question we're concerned with now is there a genus that is not a species, right? We show that there is, but is it one or more than one, right? Mm -hmm. We'll take up with that point, okay? Mm -hmm. issue or if the Pope speaks, you know, and this is the July-August issue. And uh, it's kind of interesting for uh, thing here, a little interesting quote I thought. Apostolic zeal, fraternal friendship, and supportive charity will enable them to turn daily social relationships into opportunities for awaking, awakening in others that thirst for truth, huh? which is the first condition for the saving encounter with Christ. That's interesting, right? Mm -hmm. He's saying that the thirst for truth, or there is a thirst for truth, huh? mm -hmm. which is the first condition for the saving encounter with Christ. Huh? Mm -hmm. Kind of interesting mm -hmm. thing to think about, huh? Yeah. All right. He had a thirst for truth, right? Mm -hmm. And eventually that led him to Christ, huh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These other things we think about, you know, where a man recognizes his sinfulness, and so on, um, or this humility that you need, right? They have a connection with, with truth, I think, also. Huh? There's a famous saying of uh, St. Teresa of Avila that um, um, humility is the truth. <laughs> And that's what we call in philosophy a predicatio per causum. <laughs> Humility is not truth, but its cause is truth, right? Huh? Mm -hmm. And so a person realizes um, his dependence upon God and how the good that he does, God is chiefly responsible for, right? But that he is chiefly responsible for the evil he does. Mm -hmm. uh, that truth, in a sense, is the foundation of what? True humility, right? You know? And uh, likewise, I think, you know, in terms of recognizing one's sinfulness, huh? I mean, nowadays, you know, this commonly said, you know, people don't even know what sin is, or is such a thing called sin, or, you know? But they have no desire to know the truth about the moral law, or to know the truth about their own moral condition, right? Mm -hmm. But then there's also, you know, this thirst for truth in this broader sense that leads a man, you know, to wonder about the afterlife and the universe and so on, and that, in a sense, leads him to... Christ, huh? Mm -hmm. And uh, it shows uh, the truth. Oh, the one that they're... Yeah, 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 talking yeah, about. Yeah. 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 Let's come back now to where we were yesterday, or our last class, rather. And <clears throat> everybody know what a genus is now? Hmm? Okay. How many parts are there in the definition of genus? Five. Five. And the first part is the genus of genus, which is name. name. 
Second part is what? Said with one meaning, right? You can also say said univocally, which is means with one meaning, right? But said with one meaning. The third part. Of many things, yeah. Okay? And the fourth part is what? Other in kind. Other in kind. Those many things other in kind. And the fifth and last part is what it is. Signifying what it is, right? Okay. Now because it's said of many things other in kind, right? But it has only one meaning. It can only say in general what each one of those is, huh? And that's why you need this other name called the what? Difference, right? To complete huh? your understanding of what this or that particular kind of thing is. Now, the definition of difference, again, has five parts, right? And the first four parts are exactly the same as in the definition of what? Genus. Genus. It's a name <laughs> said with one meaning of many things other in kind. Huh? Um, but the fifth and last part of that definition of difference separates it from what? Genus, Genus huh? It signifies not what it is, but how it is what it is, right? And not just how, because that might be something accidental, but how it is what it is, right? Okay. Um, now, with the word, yes? Would you say that that you um, definition of three types of difference, would you say then that the third type is the most important principle of the type? Because you also mentioned the definition of difference. Yeah, it was since they call it three definitions, but this last definition is defining difference um, as a name said of what? Many things, right? Okay. Name said with one meaning of many things, huh? Okay. That's what the five are in a sense, right? Okay. But I have to be careful with the next name here, the um, the name species, right? Or form, right? Because it's only what Porphyry calls the lowest species, huh? And that is a got another definition, right? Of a name said with one meaning of many things, huh? They also gave a definition of uh, species as you know, the name of a particular kind of thing under a genus. Huh? Okay. Now, how is that meaning of species and the other meaning of species, lowest species, of many things, huh? other only individually, right? Not other in kind, signifying what it is. Huh? How are those two definitions, or those two uh, senses there, of species related? What would you say? No, they're just one particular thing. Yeah? You could say that every lowest species is also the name of a particular kind of thing under a genus, right? But not every name of a particular kind of thing under a genus is a what? lowest species. Mm -hmm. In other words, you have, you know, more general and less general, right? More particular, less particular, and you have a whole series, right? Mm -hmm. And it's only the lowest species that has nothing below it, other in kind, only other individuals, mm -hmm. that is uh, that second definition, right? Okay. But it and all the higher ones, right, which are uh, species of what is above them and genera what below them, mm -hmm. they're all the names of what? particular kind of thing under a what? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So when we say that the same name can be both a genus and a species, right? Mm -hmm. What do we mean by species? They're not the lowest species. Mm -hmm. See? A lowest species cannot ever be a what? Genus. genus. Because it's said of many other only individually, not other in kind, huh? Or the genus is always said of many things other in kind. So no genus is a lowest species, and no lowest species is a genus, right? But if you take 
um, uh, species in this broader sense being the name of a particular kind of thing, well then there are many genera that are what? Species, right? In comparison to what is above them as opposed to what is below them, right? Except when you get to the what? Highest genus, <laughs> and that's a genus and not a species, huh? Mm-hmm. Okay? It's a genus that has no genus above it. Just as the lowest species is a species that is not a genus, right? And has no species, what? Below it, right? Okay. So when we take, you know, the five, they're called often in, from the Latin, the five predicables, right? Genus, difference, species, property, and accident. If you take them as five names, an exhaustive division of names said with one meaning of many things, Using the word species there in the sense of what? Lowest species, huh? Yeah. Oh, it applies in the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because any species above that, right, compared to what's below it, would be what? Genius. A genus, right? Okay. So you got to stop and think about yeah. those things, huh? Okay. okay. Um, now, again, just coming back and looking at it uh, another way. Um, there's only one difference between uh, genus and difference. Okay? They have the same first four parts of their definition, right? But they have one difference at the end, uh, be, which is that one is signifying what it is, the genus, and the difference, how it is what it is. Uh, there's also one difference between genus and lowest species. Which is um, so, um, any other kind or individuals? Yeah, yeah. The genus is said with one meaning of many things other in kind, right? Signifying what it is. The lower species is said of many things other only individually, right? Okay. But it also signifies what it is. Huh? So circle said of many circles, right? Signifies what it is, right? So notice you need both of those differences of genus there to separate it from both what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now how many differences are there though between difference and lowest species? Two. Two, yeah, yeah, yeah. See? Because the difference, like the genus, is said of many things other in kind, right? So it shares that difference, right? And it signifies how they are, what they are, right? Uh, the species signifies what it is, right? So species and difference are further apart, right? In meaning, <laughs> in the sense of the two differences, than species and genus, or difference and what? Genus, right? Okay. Species and genus have in common they signify what it is, right? Difference and genus have in common that they're said of many things other in kind, right? Huh? Okay. But difference has both of those <laughs> differences but what? Lowest species, huh? See that? I'm saying there's there's one difference between difference and genus, right? The genus signifies what it is, difference signifies how it is what it is, right? There's one difference in the definition of genus and lowest species. The genus is said of many things other in kind, and the lowest uh, species of many other only individually, right? Okay. But now if you compare lowest species with difference, there's two differences, right? (coughs) Yeah, 
it, it shares with the genus that it signifies what it is, which it, it separates it from difference, right? And it shares with what? Um, uh, it has a subject difference that separates both genus and difference from lowest species that set of things other in kind. Huh? So there's one difference that separates genus from what? Yeah, and another difference that separates it from difference, right? Okay. The difference has what? <laughs> Two differences, right? It compares to the lowest species, but one compares to the genus, right? Okay. So, you know, what Mr. Porphyry does, he compares, you know, genus and species and difference and what they have in common and how they, what, differ, right? Huh? Okay. So, um, I might give sometimes a genus and answer the question, what is it, right? I might also sometimes give a, what, lowest species, right? Okay. But likewise, in the um, uh, book called The Topics there in English, Aristotle puts together the dialectical problem of genus and difference, huh? Because they both signify what? Something pertaining to the nature of a thing, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, but not in a convertible way, right? In, in a more general way. Okay. Um, now we mentioned how in a definition there's only going to be one genus, right? But there tends to be what two or more differences, right? Okay. And this is a very difficult thing, but but Thomas raises a question there in the commentary on the post-analytics, huh? That if the difference huh, is taken from form <laughs> and the genus is taken from matter huh, and the unity of the thing requires unity of form, right? Shouldn't you have a difference that is what? Form. Yeah, like the lowest species, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And Thomas says, well, if we didn't know the natures of things in an outward way, <laughs> we might have differences that are what? Convertible, right? Okay. So, th the definition of difference that is common to more than one, what? kind of thing, right? That there's no difference to speak of anyway. Um, that is convertible with the thing being defined, right? And therefore that you need a combination of these two differences to specify something, right? Um, that's due, Thomas says in the commentary on the post analytics, um, to the fact that um, we know the nature of things in a kind of outward way, right? Okay. That also fits our knowing things in a confused way before distinctly. Because if no difference is really convertible with the thing, right, then you always need a combination of differences to go from a confused knowledge to a distinct knowledge, right? See, if, if you had only in your definition, say, of, of genus, take the example of this, what we were using it, right? If you only had your definition of genus, the difference that it signifies what it is, you wouldn't have distinguished between genus and those species, would you? Okay. Uh, if you only had in it the other difference, that set of many other in kind, you wouldn't be separating genus and difference, would you? But you put those two together, and it separates it from both difference and from those species, huh? But the same thing you see in geometry, right, huh? When you define the square as an equilateral and right-angled quadrilateral, no word in the definition, neither the genus quadrilateral, obviously, but neither the differences, equilateral or right angle, fits just square, doesn't it? Because the rhombus is equilateral as well as the square, and the oblong huh, is right-angled just as the square, right? But the square is the only quadrilateral that is both right-angled and what? 
equilateral, right? Okay? So you go from the confused to the distinct <laughs> when you put those two together, right? So that each name in the definition, even the, the names that are differences, right? Each name still represents a confused and somewhat indistinct knowledge of the thing you're defining, right? So when you bring them together, that it comes into, to borrow a metaphor from the eyes, into focus, right? <laughs> and now it's what? Distinct, right? Yeah. You see that? Thomas raises this problem because of things Aristotle says in the metaphysics about, you know, how genus is to difference like matter is to form and talk about the unity of form. But when Aristotle is exemplifying defining there in the post analytics, he takes difference that is not what? Convertible, right? Okay. And so, um, you'll see that, um, as a rule anyway, that you need a combination of differences, huh? Okay. Now, <clears throat> notice, once you understand these, these five names, then you can see sometimes how um, when we don't have a name for a thing, some of us don't have a name for a thing, huh? And then instead of a name, we use a what? Speech, right? I'll give an example of what I mean. Huh? Um, the names, we have names for the uh, species of um, quadrilateral, square, oblong, rhombus, rhomboid, right? Mm -hmm. And trapezium, huh? these are regular ones. Um, the first four actually parallelograms, we also have a word for parallelogram, right? Okay. Um, but now, do we have names for the species of triangle? Like scalene and isosceles and equilateral triangle, do we have a name for that? Does equilateral triangle have a name? Yeah, that's not really. Right. It, it, it's it's really what? Uh, it's, it's speech, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. But nevertheless, <coughs> we could say uh, that equilateral triangle is one species of triangle. And isosceles is another one, right? Okay. Because it's, it plays, it has the same what? Role, you might say, that square has for quadrilateral. <laughs> okay? Or rhombus or umboid, right? Okay. So um, don't be tied necessarily to always right, having one name. Huh? Sometimes a thing doesn't have a name, right? When Aristotle gets into um, the virtues and the vices, right? Huh? He says that some vices don't have a name. <laughs> and one place it comes up, for example, is when you're talking about the moral virtues and the moral virtues in between two extremes, right? And so temperance or moderation is in between the man who goes to excess in sense of pleasure, right? And the man doesn't enjoy these things at all, right? But Aristotle says the man doesn't enjoy these things at all. He's such a rarity <laughs> that doesn't come into our experience. And so we don't really have any name for the vice, uh, say. Mm -hmm. And we could name it intemperance or, you know, platonina. You know, these things are common things, right? Mm -hmm. You know, glutton, drunkard, you know. Uh, so, um, uh, so Aristotle says so we can coin a word if you want to, and, and he coins a word, you know. I mean, the guy is without sensation, it seems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he doesn't enjoy his sensation at all, right? Doesn't enjoy his food at all, doesn't enjoy <laughs> do these things. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he seems to be lacking sensation, right? <laughs> but I mean, there's no name for it, right? In common speech, huh? So either you have, you have to uh, use a, a speech or try to coin a name, right? But okay, I don't know if there's any point for us now at this late stage to coin a name for a great apple triangle, do you? Uh, uh, call it an equi-triangle or something, you know, try to make it. <laughs> you see? Okay. Yeah. And sometimes, uh, um, uh, later on, we don't have a genus in the strict sense, we might have a word that's equivocal by reason, right? But it's kind of functioning as a what? First part of the definition, we'll see examples of that. Okay. 
That's like if someone was defining uh, uh, looking as trying to see, right? And somebody might say, well, to see has many, what, meanings, right? So in a way, looking has three meanings, right? Because to see has three meanings. Okay. So we got one definition there, or not? <laughs> okay. So sometimes we use a, a speech in place of a name, we don't have a name for something, right? And sometimes we, um, uh, you know, like there's a problem with, with, with drama, right? There seem to be some kind of drama in between tragedy and comedy. And in the Renaissance, they would call it tragedy-comedy, you know? <laughs> and uh, now they sometimes use the word romance, right? But it has many meanings too, right? You know, that's common now, you'll see, in, in addition to Shakespeare, the last plays are called the romances, right? But not, not in the romantic sense, <laughs> in any different sense. So, I mean, um, but in the original edition of Shakespeare, they didn't have a name for it, right? Okay. But you recognize this. Okay. So. What the, what the difference is that are in one definition mm -hmm. be related as to themselves as a matter of form? No. no. They're related to the genus as form to matter. Huh? To each other, how they are. Well, sometimes there's an order among them, right? Because huh? mm -hmm. one tends to be made more general or something than the other. So, I mean, you have to pay attention to why we, we put these things um, like when you're defining genus, right? You see, it's a name said with one meaning, right? Of many things, right? Other than kind. See, then what it, it is, right? And there's a reason for that order among the differences, huh? Some seem to be more general than others, right? Okay. But you have to be careful, huh? Um, one thing I noticed, for example, like in the in the poetics of Aristotle, in the beginning of the poetics, he distinguishes among the imitative arts, right? And he says that they differ by that in which they imitate, right? Or what they imitate, right? or how they imitate, right? Okay. But the most basic differences are in that in which they imitate and what they imitate, right? Okay. So the painter might, um, might represent um, a happy man. Uh, the poet might represent him in words, right? And the painter would represent him in line and what? Color, right? Huh? Okay. And you have to say, well, what he's representing, though? You know, is it a happy man or a sad man, a courageous man or a coward or whatever it might be, right? Okay. Now, why does Aristotle give the difference um, of that in which they imitate before what they imitate and before how they imitate? When he says how they imitate, he's thinking of the difference in uh, fiction between epic and drama, you know, where you act it out or you narrate it, right? Like Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis and his um, Rape of Lucrece, they're called narrative poems, right? They're not considered to be dramas huh? or plays, right? Okay. But Aristotle puts that kind of difference huh? between whether you, you know, you act it out on the stage and so on, or you narrate, <coughs> right? There's a how they imitate, right? Mm -hmm. He puts that third and last, right? Mm -hmm. But why does he put first that in which they imitate? Before what they imitate? When he's distinguishing the imitative arts. It's the same word as the predicables falling, or the way you would uh, define things too. Mm -hmm. What it is first. Mm -hmm. and then, uh, but why is it closer it? to the genius? Yeah. And when you distinguish the imitative arts, is the first distinction you make by what they imitate or by that which they imitate? Oh, oh it is. 
Well, what, what do you mean by inner attainment? In other words, Mozart huh, uh-huh. can uh, represent sadness in the melody, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, Shakespeare can represent what sadness in the words of his character, right? Okay. And it's going to be the same art that's going to be about representation of sad things. Would it be in harmony and rhythm and so on? Or would it be in words? No. No. But the same art, like Mozart's art, will write happy melodies, joyful melodies, and what? Sad, Sad melodies, right? The major key and the minor key and so on. Huh? And Shakespeare will write both tragedies and what? Uh, comedies, right? Huh? So the unity of the arts, the distinction of them, is first in that in which they imitate, right? Okay. They see something like that in mechanical arts. Huh? Is there one art of making chairs? This room is well set up for what I want to do because would one art make this chair here, which is a metal chair, and those wooden chairs over there? Mm-hmm. See? And then another art would make a metal table and, and a wooden table. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No. But rather, we know from experience, right, that the carpenter will make both wooden chairs and wooden tables and wooden houses and wooden bookcases, right, mm-hmm. and so on. And the metal worker will make metal chairs and metal tables, and the plastic workers will make plastic chairs and plastic tables, and so on, right? Huh? See? So that what he's making, is it a chair, a table, or a door? It's not the first way you distinguish these arts, but by the matter in which they do it, right? And that's found also in the imitative arts. Huh? The first distinction is whether they make in words, or they make in line and color, or make in... <coughs> melody and sound and so on, right? Okay. And then the second difference, really, is what? What? What, you see? Now, to some extent, you might find a poet who can write, as Aristotle says, tragedies, but not comedies, or vice versa, right? <coughs> but nevertheless, you're going to be more able to have a man unite the writing of tragedy and comedies than a man who writes tragedies and, and requiems and so on, right? <laughs> you see? Okay. Doesn't need the same art, does it? No. Okay. Um, but now, when Aristotle defines tragedy, right? He gets down to define another thing made by the poetic art tragedy. Uh, he defines tragedy as an imitation or likeness, right? Of a course of action that is serious of some magnitude, right? And so on. And then he says in sweetened language and so on, right? There he gives what it imitates before that in which it imitates, right? Mm-hmm. And say, why does he do that? But that's, that's the reverse order of the order in which he gives them when he distinguishes the imitative arts. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, we saw the reason why you distinguish the imitative arts, right? That in which imitate is a more basic distinction. Okay? Shakespeare could write sad and joyful plays, right? And Mozart could write sad and joyful melodies. <laughs> you don't have one man who, you know, can write sad plays and sad melodies, another guy writes joyful plays and joyful melodies, right? See? Okay. But when you talk about the thing made here, and it's an imitation, a likeness of something, then why does he reverse the order? Imitation is... Imitation is an imitation of something. Yeah, yeah. Now, the, the genus and tragedy or in any of these works of the imitative arts is imitation or in English I often say likeness now because imitation has suffered a what, diminution in dignity as a word, right? Mm-hmm. You know, because of our commercial customs, right? Mm-hmm. Imitation means a cheap or mm-hmm. inferior mm-hmm. likeness, right? Mm-hmm. But so I often use the word likeness, right? Okay? But an imitation is a likeness, huh? So it's natural in starting with saying this is a likeness to say what is a likeness, what? Oh, yeah. Right. It's a likeness of this in this matter, right? Huh? Okay. 
So when I define a Shakespearean sonnet, huh, I say it's a likeness of thought and feeling, right? In 14 lines of iambic pentameter, uh, divided into three quatrains of the alternate rhyming and completed by a rhyming couplet. That's my definition of a Shakespearean sonnet, huh? But I begin by saying it's a likeness of thought and feeling, right? And then in 14 lines of iambic pentameter, etc. In the same way, when Aristotle, we define comedy, huh? we begin by saying the likeness of the, what? Of a course of action that is laughable, right? Huh? Okay? As opposed to the tragedy, which is the likeness of the serious, right? And then we go on to say, in <laughs> sweetened language, as Aristotle says, right? Okay? Language is sweetened by meter and metaphor and images and so on, huh? But when you're dis distinguishing the imitative arts, you're talking now about the ability to make something, right? And the ability to make, one ability to make is first distinguished from another ability to make by the matter in which it makes, right? See? And you're more able to make in this matter different things, like a chair, a table, and a door, in wood, right? The carpenter. And uh, he's going to make a, a, a metal chair, he had to a whole different set of tools, right? And a whole different way of working with his what? His matter, right? Mm -hmm. okay. um, so it's a little bit tricky when you talk about exactly what is the order of differences, right? Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. I mean, a good example of that, right? How careful Aristotle is there in the poetics, huh? Okay. So, what is the genus of the predicles? You said name. No, no, but more I can say than that, you can say it's name said univocally, right? With one meaning of many things, right? Okay. I, I mentioned how, how Thomas Aquinas gives you kind of a clue to this because in the Summa Contra Gentiles in the first uh, book there, first volume, um, he's taking up whether any name is said univocally of God and the creatures, right? Mm -hmm. And he's reasoning that no name is said univocally of God and what? Creatures, right? Mm -hmm. He's going to eliminate that. He's going to eliminate the other extreme position that says every name said of God and creatures is purely equivocal. <laughs> Could go by chance, right? Yeah. It's going to come into a position, right, that there are some names said of God and creatures that are equivocal by reason. Huh? Okay. But anyway, when he's eliminating that there's any name said univocally with the same meaning of God and creatures, he gives many arguments for this, right? Mm -hmm. But one of them is an either or argument, right? Mm -hmm. That every name said univocally of many things is either a genus or a difference or a species or a property or an accident. And then he goes and eliminates each one of those five, right? Huh? And therefore there's no name said univocally of God and creatures, right? Um, but no, so that argument to be good, that has to be what? It has to be exhausted, right? Huh? See? So that's what gave me the clue, right? That, in a sense, what he's done for us in the Aesiloge, right? Is to dis give us a complete division, you might say, right? Of name said with one meaning, or a name said univocally, of many things, right? Mm. Okay? Mm. And uh, it's kind of a clue, right? Mm. Okay? Yeah, otherwise, St. Thomas' argument on the universal. Yeah, yeah. Now, you can see that his vision is exhaustive because either it signifies something inside the nature, or something outside the nature, right? Mm -hmm. There's no what? No um, Crisscrossing divisions, right? Okay. And you could say, um, <laughs> um, you could say, Signifying what it is, 
or signifying how it is what it is. Now, is there any possibility besides those two? If a name signifies something inside the nature, right? By the nature of the thing, we mean what it is, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So either it's got to signify what it is, or at least how it is what it is, right? Mm -hmm. It signifies neither what it is nor how it is what it is. How does it signify something pertaining to what it is? Mm -hmm. Those seem to be the only two possibilities, right? Okay. Now, um, of many things other in kind, or many things not other in kind. Okay? Or, in other words, saying that. Only individually, right? Well, get not stay there, I mean, perfectly. Only individually. I guess any other possibility besides those two? No. Huh? Okay. Now, if it signifies what it is of many things other than kind, that gives you the genus, right? Okay. It signifies what it is of many things not other in kind that gives you the lowest species, right? Okay. If it signifies how it is what it is of many things other in kind, right, then you have what? Difference. Huh? Now, why isn't there a fourth thing here? Remember we saw before sometimes, right? Crisscross divisions. Uh, like in the parts of the what? play, mm -hmm. before, not before, after and not after. You get only three and not four things. Because mm -hmm. it can't be any part of a plot that is either before anything or after anything, because I have no picture of anything, right? <laughs> okay. This is more difficult to see. Why isn't there a difference here, which in a way is convertible with a what? Lowest species, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Like rational seems to be with man, right? Mm -hmm. I see Porphyry, when he gives examples, he, he's using Platonic examples, right? This is the Neoplatonic school, right? And the Platonists thought that there were what? Immortal rational animals. Mm -hmm. Okay? So they defined man as a mortal, rational animal. And then there were these kind of you know, air-like spirits like <laughs> Shakespeare has and Ariel there and uh, <laughs> the Tempest. <laughs> and they were what? Immortal, rational animals, right? So neither what? Rational, right? Nor mortal would be convertible with man, right? You have to say both, right? <laughs> now though the example might be false in the sense that there are no what? It exemplifies the, the definition of difference, right? As being said of many other in uh, kind, right? Huh? Mm -hmm. Now, Thomas, when Aristotle explains, you know, how definition is a beginning of demonstration, right? The middle term of demonstration, in a way. In Aristotle, in the second book of the Postanalytics, he talks about how to investigate a definition and so on. But he speaks there as if the, you know, one way of doing it is to start with the genus and then try to add the differences, right? Mm -hmm. And Aristotle seems to be speaking there as if you need a combination of differences, right? That are convertible to the thing being defined, right? And that Aristotle seems to be speaking as if differences are as Porphyry was to say later on, right? Said of many things other than kind, right? Mm -hmm. And only a combination of differences, right? Okay. And Thomas um, raises a question about that in the Postanalytics. Because, um, as we learn in, in wisdom and metaphysics, uh, the genus is taken more from what is material in the thing, like animal, mm -hmm. 
man, right? And the difference is more from the form. But if the thing really is one thing, it's got to have one what? Form. So why shouldn't there be a difference that corresponds to that, right? Well, the answer Thomas gives to that question in the Postanalytics is that we don't know things inwardly very much. Huh? We know things outwardly because our knowledge is our senses. And that's why we have to what? As is an English phrase there, think about something, right? Okay. And when you're trying to define something, you're thinking about the thing, right? And you're trying to get inside to the nature of the thing, what it is. And we'll speak of the definition as bringing out what the thing is, right? Why do we use that phrase, to bring out what the thing is? Because the nature is inside and hidden to us, right? The central thinker in philosophy there, human thought, really, Heraclitus said, nature loves to hide. That's his famous saying, huh? nature loves to hide. See? And the main reason, the first reason why nature loves to hide is because it's something within, right? And we know things through our senses and therefore the outside of things. And, okay. and so to a certain extent we tend to what? To guess at the interior from the what? Outside, right? And here we often guess about people, right? And from the outside. <clears throat> and Thomas gives there's a reason why we don't have differences that are what? Convertible, right? And, you know, thinking kind of outward way. But this also, I think you could also say, it also fits the third thing we're saying there, remember the, the uh, order in, in uh, knowing the same thing, remember? In the natural world. Mm -hmm. The thing is singular with sense, universal and understood. And we know things in an outward way before inwardly. And in English, outward is almost a synonym for sensible, right? The outward appearance of something. And then we know things in a confused way before distinctly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It also fits our knowing things in a confused way that um, no part of the definition is really a what, altogether distinct knowledge of species. No part of the definition is convertible with the species, right? Every part of the definition in some way is common to the species you're trying to define and at least one other thing, right? And only a combination of the differences brings you from a confused knowledge to a what? A distinct knowledge, right? If you had a difference in there that was already <laughs> peculiar to this species, you'd already arrived before you had gone from the confused to the distinct, right? Mm -hmm. So by definition, the definition is a way of going from a confused or indistinct knowledge of what something is to a what? Distinct knowledge, right? And sometimes I ask my colleagues, my colleagues and help say, what is reasoning? And, and I said, don't you reason in your class? You know, what is reasoning? <laughs> and they can't define what reasoning is, right? Okay. Now, I define reasoning as coming to know or guess a statement through other statements, right? Okay. That tells you more distinctly what reasoning is than the word reasoning does, right? Okay. What is calculating? It's coming to know or guess a number through other numbers, right? Okay. Um, so, it's only the definition as a whole that gives you a distinct knowledge of what the thing is. But each part of the definition corresponds to a confused knowledge in some way of the thing. When they bring them together, it enables the mind to go confused to the distinct knowledge to bring the thing into focus in the sense of distinct, right? Okay. So, um, this here is not really in practice a what? Alternative because of our knowing things in an outward way. And knowing things always in a confused way before distinctly. So these are the only three possibilities, right? So it's more difficult to see how these exhaust the possibilities and then the um, property
be an accident, too, right? Because they're like odd and even, right? Either connected with nature or not connected with nature, right? Mm -hmm. Follows upon the nature or doesn't follow upon the nature. It's got to be one or the other, right? <laughs> you, you have a definition of reasoning again. Do you say coming to know or guess? Coming to know or guess a statement. A statement, yeah. Through right. other statements. Huh? Yeah. By calculating, adding, subtracting, multiplying, or dividing. It's numbers. Is coming to know or guess a number, two other numbers, right? And I say, why do I say yes, right? Well, sometimes when we add, subtract, multiply, or divide numbers, even if we add, subtract, multiply, or divide correctly, we're not always sure of the numbers we're adding, right? Mm -hmm. See? So when somebody, you know, starts to calculate how much is going to, you know, have a party or something, right? And he's gonna, how much is going to cost, right? Well, how many people are going to be there? Well, about 25, right? Mm -hmm. You know. I'm not sure about the number, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And how many beers we first and print? Well, I think about, you know, I don't know, four beers a person, okay? Now, four times 25 is 100, so it's 100 beers, right? You know? Am I sure about that number? No. I don't know. But I'm not sure there'll be 25, it might be more than I'm not sure that there'll probably be four beers. <laughs> they might take more, right? You see? You see? And, and the same thing can happen in um, reasoning, right? Sometimes you're not sure of the statements from which you reason, right? In which case, if they're only probable, it's a guess, right? But other times, even if you're sure about the statements which you reason, uh, the conclusion doesn't follow necessarily. It's not a syllogism. Mm -hmm. Okay? So if I'm sure I had a lousy you know, meal at Restaurant X yeah. last week, um, I might reason from that that I shouldn't go there this week, right? Yeah. Um, and if I'm sure that I, that I had a lousy meal, no question was lousy, um, I can't, it doesn't fall necessarily that it was lousy last week, but I have to be lousy this week right now. Okay. So it's not a syllogism, right? So I'm, I'm reasoning from last week to this week, but it doesn't fall necessarily, right? Okay. But you can reason necessarily from only probable opinions, right? Just like you can add, subtract, multiply very rigorously numbers you're not sure about. Mm -hmm. Now, just uh, the, the genus sun is coming to know or guess, or is that actually no, not no, true? No. This is not reasoning, this is defining, right? But it resembles reasoning, right? And what defining and reasoning have in common is that there are ways of coming to know what you don't know. To what you do know, right? Okay. I'm thinking though, if, um, if coming to know, I guess, a statement through other statements is the definition of reasoning, then there, in this definition there should be genus, no? And I was wondering what the genus is. Coming to know. Coming to know, I guess, yeah. That's what I was thinking. As soon as I just say coming to know, period, you know, but then using knowing in a kind of looser way, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, you might know by experience something hits you in the head, you don't yeah, reason that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Albert de Grey, as I mentioned before, huh, mm -hmm. that's the way he divides logic, right? Into the art of the simple unknown, right? The art of the finding, okay. and the art of the complex unknown, the art of reasoning, huh? And that's in a way anticipated by Plato and the Mino, huh? where he talks about, you know, the art of defining first, when you're trying to define what virtue is, right? And then in the third part, where you're trying to reason whether virtue can be taught or not, right? And then the middle part of the dialogue touches upon what's common to the two, huh? How can you investigate what you don't know, right? How can you come to know what you don't know, right? Um, <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Um, now, going back huh, to where we left off last time. Huh? Um, if you take now species in the sense of what? The name of a particular kind of thing on the genus. We pointed out that the same name can be both a what? Yeah. 
And that shows that, in a way, the distinction there is not an absolute distinction, but a what? Yeah. OK. And every science has these relative distinctions, right? So in, in mathematics, you have double and what? Half, for example, right? OK. In biology, you have father and son, or mother and daughter, right? Huh? OK. And the same person or the same thing can be both, but in relation to different things, right? And um, the same thing can be a cause and a what? Effect. Effect, but not of the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, in particular, we talk about the same thing can be a mover and what? Move, right? Mm -hmm. So if I line up my books here, you know, usually in class, you know, I have a series of erasers and line them up, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but, uh, the Pope speaks there, right? <laughs> Is that a mover or moved? Well, yeah. It's moved by this, mm -hmm. and it's moving this over here, right? Mm -hmm. okay. So it's a moved mover, right? Mm -hmm. It's moving something else through being moved itself, right? So the same thing can be a cause and effect. It can be a mover and a moved. Right? Okay. Now, um, as you know, reason looks before and after, right? Mm -hmm. And the cause is before the effect in the fifth or crowning sense, right? Mm -hmm. So when I look, you know, does every cause have a cause before it, right? Or do you eventually come to a what? First cause, right? Okay. Or is every effect also a cause if you come to an effect that is not, right? You're looking before and after the crowning sense there before, aren't you? And it's in the um, second book of wisdom that Aristotle speaks universally of this. Huh? Okay, but in particular, he talks about this in natural philosophy and ethics and so on. Huh? That there's a first cause, a cause that is not an effect. Right. Okay? But it's very important to look before and after in the sense of the common sense of before. Right. Okay? Now. Um, when you talk about the genus and the species, is there a before and after there? Yes. Yeah. Which is before? The genus. Yeah. The genus is before the species, huh? Okay. Now, what sense of before is the genus before the species? Third sense. The third sense, yeah, in the discourse of reason, right? Okay. And notice how that, in a way, resembles the second sense, right? Second sense was in being, right? And you could say it seemed to resemble that because animal, it seems, can be without a dog. You can have an animal without a dog, but you can't have a dog without a what? Animal, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. But in the discourse of reason, animal comes before dog, right? And you said naturally, you know, if you ask a student out of the blue in class, what's a dog? Come on, tell me. <laughs> well, it's an animal, it's what he'll usually start with. I say, right? Okay. What's a sonnet? You know, that's a poem. <laughs> right? You see? In other words, they'll, they'll naturally begin with the genus before the species, right? So we're going to look before and after in the what? third sense of before, right? Okay. In ethics, you know, we look at the goods of the soul and the goods of the body. And outside goods, and we ask which are what better, right? Huh? And the reason that the inside goods are better than the outside goods, and among the inside goods, that the goods of the soul are better than the goods of the body, right? And then in the ethics, we go through the goods of the soul, and we see that some are better than others, right? Okay. So we're looking before and after in the what fourth sense of before, right? Huh? The Greeks wondered whether time, what? Every time had a time before it? Or whether there's a beginning of time, right? And Aristotle says he didn't know. <laughs> and he gives, um, in the topics there, he's talking about probable reasoning. Uh, 
uh, it gives us as an example there something that we long to know whether the universe is eternal or not, right? Or the beginning in time, huh? And Thomas, you know, in the Middle Ages, he considers arguments that people gave down through history for or against the eternity of the world, and he says none of them are what? Conclusive, right? None of them are certain, huh? And uh, we know only by faith, right? Huh? At least, you know, there were no arguments up to his time anyway, right? That would show this, right? Yeah. People wonder at the Big Bang and that sort of stuff, you know, <laughs> whether, you know, time didn't have a beginning, right? You know? Okay. But we know it more by, by faith than by reason, right? Mm -hmm. But notice, reason is asking that, right? The time, you know, today and yesterday, right? And tomorrow. Are those absolute distinctions? Because mm -hmm. today can be yesterday and. <laughs> Or, or tomorrow, you know, it could be today, <laughs> and so on. But does every day have yesterday, right? Or is there a first day? <laughs> and does every day have a tomorrow or a someday? Well, we know in, in terms of our life that there's a first day, right? You know, the grandchildren the first day for them, right? And, uh, and, and there's a last day for us, right? A mortal life anyway. Okay. But as time as a whole is, is that we're getting our end in time. Well, we, we find out in Genesis that it did have a beginning, right? Okay. Time wasn't always. And in the Apocalypse, it speaks of the end of time. Have you seen in the Apocalypse? Time will come to an end. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. See? So there you're looking before and after in the first sense of before, which is at the time, right? Okay. See how important Shakespeare's definition is, right? How it fits. Uh, so we ask now, does every genus have a genus before it, right? Or another way of saying that, is every genus a species of something before it? Mm -hmm. And is every species a what? A genus of something after it, right? Or do you come to something that is a species only, right? <laughs> and not a genus. Or do you come to something that is a genus and not a what? A species, right? Mm -hmm. Now, um, <clears throat> are there, in other words, lowest species <laughs> and highest what? Genus. Highest genus or genera? Right? Of course, we gave a definition of lowest species, didn't we? Okay. And um, are there lowest species that we, we know? And it's easiest to see this in the case of what? The mathematical examples, right? Mm -hmm. But there doesn't seem to be different kinds of square, right? There are different kinds of quadrilateral, but not different kinds of square, right? And so if you're thinking of the shape, right? Okay. Or different kinds of what? Circle, right? Mm -hmm. Or different kinds of seven, right? There can be seven men and seven dogs and seven chairs, but that's man, dog, and chair is kind of accidental to what seven is, right? Okay. Seven seems to be a lowest species, right? Okay. Uh, now, natural science is not as clear, right? Huh? Is dog or cat a lowest species? Okay. Or the different kinds of dogs and cats, right? Okay. You know, a lot of times the biologist tries to take this kind of a rule of thumb, you know, Reproduction together, right? <laughs> As a science, we come to a lowest species, right? Huh? But um, it's not as clear, obviously, as math, right? Huh? So we ask, is man, huh? <coughs> we're very familiar with this animal called man, huh? is man a lowest species, huh? Okay. In other words, is the, is the division in the white men and black men and little men and so on? Is this kind of an accidental thing, huh? Like if you're dividing circles into red, white, and blue circles or something, right? Mm -hmm. But they would not be different species of circle, right? Huh? Mm -hmm. Well, in order to have um, a species under a genus, those species have to have what? Differences, right? Mm -hmm. And those differences have to determine what's intrinsic to the genus, huh? Mm -hmm. And so if you take a simple mathematical example, 
when we divide triangle into equilateral isosceles and scalene, we're determining something intrinsic to the very definition of triangle, which would be something like a plane figure contained by three straight lines. Mm -hmm. And those two straight lines can be all equal or just two of them or none of them, right? Mm -hmm. But red, white, and blue <laughs> aren't three ways of being three-sided, are they? Mm -hmm. They're purely accidental, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you get down to man, if man is an animal with reason, as we were defining him before uh, with Shakespeare, um, if there were species of men in the strict sense, right, would have to be different kinds of what? Reason, right? Huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, does the white man, the yellow man, really have a different kind huh, of reason, right? I don't think you want to say that, would you? Interesting to see Heisenberg's talks after the war, because you know, during the war, of course, you had the Nazis talking about the master race <laughs> and, and all these sort of things, you know. And uh, Heisenberg was talking to the young students now, because his background is there, right? And he was talking about his, his days as a student in Copenhagen under Niels Bohr, right? Where men came from all over the world to study under Bohr, and they were different, what, nationalities and so on, right? Mm -hmm. And then finally he had, what? the Japanese and so on, making real contributions to physics, right? Not just learning physics for the Westerners, but, you know, you know, developing new things, right? Huh? And then you realize there was nothing really, what? Different. Yeah, yeah, it's not really a different reason that we have, right? Huh? You know? And Heidegger says philosophy speaks Greek. Well, that's kind of a compliment to the Greeks, right? Mm. <laughs> Schrodinger, the scientist, says science is a Greek way of looking at things. <laughs> But it's because the Greeks, you know, made great contributions to philosophy and to science and so on. But several S is not really what, by definition, Greek, right? Mm -hmm. Philosophy is not in Greek or in English, or, you know. Even though you might see one language is, is, is a little more suitable for philosophy maybe than another one, huh? Mm -hmm. um, some grammars, you know, they study grammar, you know, I mean, some of them have more figures, more uh, parts of speech that are explicit to the language, right? Mm -hmm. you know, Latin is not, it doesn't have all the parts of speech. It doesn't have the article. Mm -hmm. And you see that in uh, medieval Latin, they're trying to stick in an article. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you see L-Y or something, right? Mm -hmm. I used to think that's what it's for. No, no, in French came from, I guess it did. Say it comes in Italy. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> So that's what, didn't they put uh, William Poo there? In, oh, in William Poo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they had to kind of find some way of doing this, right? And uh, you see a problem there in the translation we're mentioning there, the Our Father, right? In the seventh petition, and deliver us from evil, right? But the Greek says, the evil one, right? Whole. Oh, it's got the article there, right? And, well, of course, in, in Latin, deliver it was amalo, right? There's no article there, right? So we tend to take it, as we translate it, right? yeah. to deliver us from evil. But really, the Greek says more, but deliver us from the what? evil one, right? Mm -hmm. it, it actually has, a, and it can go either way. Um, because the same form is neutered in, in the message. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, and that's in the Greek too, yeah, it's interesting. So the article, but then you go, there's some other languages, and maybe you don't even have the verb to be, you know? Yeah. They tell me, you know, that the verb to be came last, you know, you know, in the evolution of language, if you wish. So it's kind of hard, you know, to express yourself as clearly, right, in some languages. But nevertheless, I wouldn't say, you know, that philosophy is, by definition, Greek. <laughs> you know, if it's not in Greek, it's not. <laughs> um, well, now it's in Quebec there, you know, there's to be kind of a joke, because sometimes... French Canadians wanted to send their students out to Quebec to study, and especially for, for the sake of theology and religion, right? The word French is not going to get correct. You know? <laughs> 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 okay. You know, France is the oldest, you know, down in the church and so on, right? <laughs> so, uh, uh, so notice, huh? Um, so if man is an animal with reason, you have to have different kinds of reason to have what species of man, right? Now, though someone said, with men and women, maybe there's some <laughs> prima facie evidence. <laughs> uh, 
even there, you know, I don't go quite that far. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so, may I make an example then of a lower species, right? Huh? Okay. Um, when you get to, uh, to to the virtues, right? Huh? <clears throat> it's uh, you know a lot of times you speak of the cardinal virtues. Huh? Now, is temperance a lowest species? Like you said, it's a different way of being temperate. Let's say food and drink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, moderation food, moderation drink, and moderation in sex, these are maybe three different what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think to some extent experience might tell you that, right? Yeah. And by the way, something <coughs> can be said of individual substances. Now, in, in the text that we have of Aristotle, in the categories and also in the, um, the topics, right, he distinguishes these into ten right away. Huh? Okay. But Thomas, in his commentary on the physics, where the question of categories comes up, in his commentary in the fifth book of metaphysics, where Aristotle again refers to these ten, Thomas divides into two and three, right? as a way of arriving at what? Ten, right? Okay. In other words, he follows a rule of two or three that we'll talk about later on. <laughs> okay. And I had, I had some students at my house last night there and we're looking at the sixth book of wisdom, right? Sixth book of after natural philosophy, huh? sixth book of metaphysics. And Aristotle in the second reading there, he recalls four senses of being that he had talked about in the fifth book of the metaphysics, right? He just recalls the four of them, right? Okay. So you read that four, right, rather than two or three, right? Okay. Now, you go back, though, to the what? Fifth book, where he originally does this, right? And he divides into two. <laughs> and then he subdivides one of them into three. Now, sometimes, as Thomas says, you know, about Aristotle, you know, brevitate students, you know, seeking brevity, which is a soul of wisdom, right? You know, he may, you know, run together, you know, a division with a subdivision, right? But in order to understand it, you have to, what, make explicit, right? See? So here, he, he, what, divides into two, subdivides one into three, ends up with four, right? But in the next book, he just numerates the four, right? Okay. Now, we had an example of that, something like that in Thomas, right? When Thomas was dividing order in comparison to reason, he divided it right away into four. Remember that? Right? If you examine the order, it really is based upon what? First division into two and then the second division. Yeah, yeah. There's the order not made by reason and the order made by reason, right? And then he subdivides the order made by reason by that in which it is made, right? The order made by reason in its own acts, which we're concerned with in this study of logic, right? The order made by reason in the acts of the will, that's what we're concerned with in ethics, right? And then the order made by reason in exterior matter, and that belongs to the art of carpentry and the art of metal work and so on, right? Okay. So how does he get four orders? Not really by one division, does he? No. By division into two. Made by reason, not made by reason. That's two, right? And then made by reason in its own acts, in the acts of the will, next to the matter. Okay. But where we taught the students, he says about Aristotle, right? Mm -hmm. He what? He 
gives the result of a division and a subdivision in one thing, right? Okay. But one to explain this, you'd have to take it apart, right? And say, hey, the last three orders he talks about are all orders made by reason. The first order he talks about is not made by reason. That's the fundamental distinction, isn't it? Okay. And it's very illuminating, right? And Thomas saw obviously that difference. That's why he put the order not made by reason first, because an actual order is more basic than the order made by reason, huh? Comes before. <laughs> you gotta be orderly in talking about order, right? <laughs> Do you see that? Huh? So, um, sometimes um, you'll find that Aristotle or Thomas somewhere will make it more explicit the divisions, right? Um, other times we just have a text where, you know, we have to let the little thinking ourselves, right, and take it apart, right? Okay. And I just mentioned it because I, I happened to be doing this last night and we we're, were looking at the sixth book and we've done some things in the fifth book. And as they say in the sixth book, when he comes back to the various senses of being, he speaks of four groups of meanings of being, right? Right away. You could eliminate two of them is not the main concern of the wise man and two he's going to be concerned with. But you go back, that's obviously based upon the previous book, right? Go back to the previous book, he divides into two, and then the second he subdivides into three, right? See? But you don't always have that, maybe in what's come down to us in Aristotle, right? Okay. So what you find in the text of the categories, he divides it into ten, right? Right away. Okay. And then the, the similar text in the topics, he has the same text, exactly the same order. <laughs> you know, those are the two main texts, right? But it's right away into ten. Okay. But Thomas, knowing you know, all of Aristotle, he knows the what various divisions, right? Set it up, right? Okay. So. Um, you see, he does this in two places. One, one is in the third book of the physics where he's talking about acting upon undergoing emotion. And he has to explain the doctrine, the categories, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we don't have any commentary by Thomas on the categories of Aristotle, so we have to kind of pull things out, right? Just like, you know, there's no commentary on the Isagogia by Thomas, but you can pull that thing out and uh, zoom it kind of into that, right? Mm -hmm. Little bits, you know, so I go around. If I find something you know it's relevant, I said I'll pick it up and put it in my file. Right? <laughs> so he says, if you have an individual substance like a man, let's say, or a horse like champion, right? Huh? Mm -hmm. Something can be said of man, of Socrates, let's say, or champion, by reason of what they are, right? Okay. <clears throat> by reason of what it is. Okay. So I can say, for example, of Socrates, that he is a man, right? What is Socrates? A man, right? What is champion? A horse, right? What is Moppet? We get this beast at home. Moppet is a cat, right? Okay. We used to have her mother, Tabitha. What is Tabitha? Okay. Okay. And these are all being said of individual substances like Socrates or Champion or Moppet um, by reason of what they are, right? Okay. <clears throat> now, Aristotle, in the categories, he calls this um, highest genus substance, right? Huh? But in the topics, he calls it what it is. <laughs> okay. So you're obviously thinking of individual substances, huh? I can say more generally of what? Champion and of, of uh, Socrates that they're animals, right? Okay. And more generally that they're what? Living bodies, right? Which is common to them in the planet. Right? And more generally body, right? But most generally, what? Substance, huh? Okay. 
Of course, in the beginning, the philosophers tend to identify body and substance almost because that's the only substance they know, right? But later on, they realize that they're not medical. So this gives rise to the category of substance. Now, other things can be said of Socrates or Champion or Moppet, not by reason of what they are, but by reason of something existing in them that is not what they are. Right? Mm -hmm. okay. By reason of something in them. In addition to what they are. Right? the council going to eventually divide this into three, right? They first divide it into two. And then, okay. But before we get involved in that, let's just exemplify some things. Huh? So we might say that Socrates is what? Courageous. Huh? We might say Socrates is wise. So they deny it. <laughs> we might say Socrates is healthy. Huh? Everybody else is at the table drunk in the symposium, right? <laughs> Socrates walks up and takes his morning, you know, bop and uh, his usual day, right? The surgeon used to tell me that the conic in the old days and the young go for two or three days without sleep, right? Oh. I was thinking. And <laughs> I'd be all shocked to one night. <laughs> The old story is told you that know, Aristotle would sit there, you know, uh, with a metal basin and a ball, you know, and he starts to all stink, you know, and drop and bang. And, you know, <laughs> I'm trained to do that, you know, but it's, it's interesting the way these stories begin, right? Huh? <laughs> the, the legend about Aristotle's death is that he died by chronic, from chronic indigestion brought on overwork. <laughs> but they didn't even know what the guys died of, right? I mean, even, you know, they don't know what Mozart died of for sure, you know? Mm -hmm. Stall or mm -hmm. <laughs> Alexander the Great didn't know what he died of either. Mm -hmm. Reason of something in them, right? Other than what they are, right? <clears throat> so we might say that they're healthy or they're sick or they're beautiful or they're ugly or they're yeah? big or they're little, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the third thing is by reason of something outside of them. Let's say exactly what I'm going to subdivide it. Okay. Now, what would be an example of something said of me by reason of something outside of me? That's not what I am, right? It doesn't really exist in me, right? What's outside of me? Huh? One obvious example is that I am what? Clothed, right? Huh? Very good example of it, right? Okay. My clothing is not what I am, and it's not in me, like my health is in me, right? And yet, I am said to be clothed, right? And the reason is something outside of me, right? Okay. <clears throat> now, Thomas um, will not subdivide the first one, right? Mm -hmm. I'm expecting to subdivide the first one. But he's going to see a reason for subdividing the second here. And the reason for subdividing the what, third, right? Huh? <clears throat> and he's going to get eventually three under the second, three highest genera. And under the third, he's going to get six. But those six are not as important as these three. And of course, substance is the most important of all, right? Restyle yeah. doesn't spend much time on the last six, but he does on the first four, right? Huh? Got this 
fundamental division down. I'm going to mm -hmm. subdivide the second one here, right? Mm -hmm. I was a freshman in college. I was in this classroom. I had blackboards all around the room, right? Mm -hmm. And I had a math teacher, right? And he would start to fill up the equations and the deduction. He'd go all the way around the whole room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? He'd be flying around. Mm -hmm. He was teaching, you know, <laughs> he, he felt the whole boy, he would have raised it in the United States. Nice guy. Anyway. <laughs> he used to go to the class and he'd have a cigar, you know. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, don't go pay off my hand a cigar, you wouldn't even dare, you know. <laughs> and uh, he had kind of stiff leg because he had been a paratrooper or something, you know, oh, or, you know, so he hurt his leg a little bit. I can't do about that. Huh? He was a really tough guy, you know, mm -hmm. math. At least, kind of, I believe he was a math, modern mathematician. You know, I can define anything who I want to, you know. <laughs> my brother Mark is going to argue with me about this. <laughs> um, yeah. Thomas says that something in the second way now, huh? something can be said of me by reason of something in me. Either absolutely, he says, or towards another. Okay? So let's put up what we're dividing here, subdividing. Said of individual substances, right? By reason of something in them, Either absolutely, now absolutely means in itself, not towards another, right? Or towards another. Now in the Greek here, the Greek for towards another is pros t. Pros T. Make me write up high there, right? Pros T, right? Toward something, right? Mm -hmm. okay. You say toward something, right? Now in Latin, when they translate this very literally, they'll translate it as ad aliquid, right? okay? Towards something, you might say. Huh? Um, sometimes they'll, they'll use the abstract word relation, right? Huh? Okay. But the word relation, being abstract, <clears throat> doesn't give you the idea so much of what this really is about, right? It's being towards another, right? I am taller than you, or I am shorter than you, right? The reason is something in me, right? But not in itself, but towards you, I'm taller or shorter, right? Or I am your teacher, or I am your father or your son, right? A reason is something in me towards what? Another, right? Okay. So let's now use the concrete way, post T. The thing about the word relation is, you know, and now we have a distraction of abstraction, you know, here everybody in their sermons talking about relationships, you know. <laughs> so I always hear relationship. Huh? Well, that's an abstraction of an abstraction, right? See? But, you know, the word relation is kind of a, um, it can be a misleading word. Huh? We can speak of, of a relation between us, right? Mm -hmm. See? That's not really what, what this thing is, something between us. Mm -hmm. It's me towards you and what you are towards me, right? I might be to you a father, and you might be to me, what, a son. Mm -hmm. Or I might be to you shorter, and you are to me, what, taller, right? Mm -hmm. You know? It's not like relation is something in between us. Mm -hmm. And we, we tend to think, you know, use the word relation, right? And there's some relation between me. You know, I got my son or my wife. There's some relation between us, right? No, I am to her a husband. She is to me a wife, right? I am to... Marcus, a father, he is to me a son, right? Okay. 
and the sun towards somebody else, right? Okay. Um, so it's better to use this prosthia, uh, towards something, towards another. <coughs> I mentioned there, I think, when you went to the Gospel of St. John, that uh, the actual Greek word there in the beginning is pros, right? Mm -hmm. We don't translate it maybe as good as we could. Huh? In the beginning was the word, and the word was what? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Greek says pros. Archidim ologas, huh? Erogos ain pros ton theon. Towards God, right? And then and the word was God, right? And when you study the Trinity huh, and the distinction, um, it's, a, it's based upon what? Relatives. Mm -hmm. okay. He's a subsisting relation. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, but if you know Aristotle's uh, chapter on relation, you know this word, proski, mm -hmm. these words. And then you look at the Greek of the beginning of John's Gospel right away, that peeps mm -hmm. out, right? Mm -hmm. The distinction between the Father and the Son is a relative distinction. Huh? Mm -hmm. okay. Albeit it's much different. In this kind of relation, right? Mm -hmm. you know, something in God is maximus, right? But something of the character of the relation is found there. Mm -hmm. And that's very important for understanding the Trinity. But, mm -hmm. but uh, I just mentioned that, you know, to point out how important it is to go to the very words that Aristotle uses. Mm -hmm. And how the Latin, you know, when they say that, I'll it. But they don't translate, you know, and the word was but toward uh, God, but they say, awkward in Latin, right? I think in English we usually pronounce it as with, right? I mean, it was the word, the word was God, right? The word was God, right? But with is not really the Greek word there. So this is very important in anyway. English. I'm surprised that, that I haven't seen that yet in town the same way or, or in, in, in the best novel. They see very clearly the distinctions of this kind, right? I haven't seen them comment on the, the actual Greek word there, do you? Yeah. I can't see anybody. I mean, I'm sure, I don't see, I'm sure you see this thing, you know, it just jumps out, you know, because it jumped into me when we were studying this thing, you know, how, what a bad word this was in some sense, right, and, mm -hmm. and how Aristotle's words are much better than Coast T, so I had that very much in mind, and, and, and the acclimatizations where you have to talk about it, right, and then studying John's Gospel, we just you know, and, uh, is this a brief father's name? Maybe, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I mean, if you run across something, I mean, I, 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 I don't know everybody, obviously, I've read everybody. And, uh, uh, Chris is the, no. You know, we kind of invested in, in, in Tom and she's my specialist development of this. Oh, okay. Okay. okay, now, absolutely, huh? Thomas divides that into two. Huh? One, you know, fact, connected with the fact that these things are what? Material things, right? He ties it up with matter and form, in a way. And with matter, he ties up quantity. So the question here, let me get the concrete thing first. The Greek will say, how much? How many? And this gives rise to quantity. And the form, how? gives rise to the category of quality. Okay. So quantity is something that things, material substances have um, because they are material, right? Okay. Yet their size and what they are not the same thing, right? And even in speech we kind of see that, right? A man and his size, to be a man and be five foot ten of the same thing? Hmm? If you're bigger than other man, are you more a man for that reason? No. You're more in some sense. <laughs> your size, you're bigger, huh? But you're not more a man, huh? Okay. Now, um, the Pythagoreans, and to some extent the Platonists, they confuse quantity with what? substance, right? Mm -hmm. And you have that same mistake repeated in, in Descartes in modern times, huh? Mm -hmm. Where they identify quantity extension, right? Mm -hmm. 
with material substance, huh? the very substance of these things. And when I argue against Descartes, I say kind of playfully, well, you know, Descartes never grew up. <laughs> because if your quantity was your substance, then when your quantity changed, you no longer have the same substance, right? Mm. So, so you never grew up. <laughs> and to grow up, it means what? One of the same substance has a different what? Size, right? Mm. As you go through your years of growth, right? Mm. Okay. Um, and I made a theological uh, uh, application of that. Huh? Uh, this confusion and, and the part between quantity and substance um, contradicts the, what, the Eucharist, right? Because in the Eucharist, we have, as the Church says, a transubstantiation, right? Huh? The substance of the bread is turned into the substance, right? Of Christ's body, right? And the uh, substance of the wine is turned into the uh, blood of Christ, huh? okay? But the accidents, as we say, right? The quantity of the bread remains, right? The quantity of the wine remains. And the qualities you mean, right? And the sense qualities, I suppose quantity, huh? Okay? But if you identify the quantity with the substance of these things, mm. well then the substance remains, right? Mm. You're in heresy now, right? Mm. So, um, uh, no, for us, you know, a sign of, of the greater truthfulness of Aristotle's philosophy over St. Descartes is that Aristotle's philosophy is compatible with the faith, right? Mm. But Descartes here was going to but notice, that's not the reason why Aristotle's philosophy is useful, huh? It's just the reverse, right? Mm -hmm. It's because it's true that it's useful in theology, huh? mm -hmm. It's not true because it's useful in theology. Mm -hmm. you know, go back to the question there in, in, in the uh, youth before, right, huh? Mm -hmm. know? The pious of what the gods approve of. And Socrates says, well, is it pious because the gods approve of it, or do they approve of it because it's pious, right? Mm -hmm. And I sometimes ask students that question about the commandments, right? I say, this commandment to honor your father and mother, this commandment to not kill, right? And I say, is it good to honor your father and mother because it's a commandment to do so? Or is there a commandment to do so because it is good? Okay. Did God give us that commandment so it would be good to honor your father and mother? <laughs> or did he give us that commandment so we would do what in fact is right and just now? And did you know, murdering your neighbor become bad because God made a commandment against it? Or did he make a commandment against it because it is a bad thing to do? Your whole understanding of the commandments depends upon the answer to that question, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and even, you know, even students today, they, they, they seem right away, you know, that, that it's, um, it's not bad because of a commandment against it, but because it is bad, it's such a terrible thing, he's made a commandment against it, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Now, there could be a commandment of another kind, right? Huh? You know, like you know, you stay in your room until I tell you to come out. <laughs> it's not in itself, you know, or you drive on the right side of the street, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not bad to drive on the left side of the street. Therefore, they make a commandment. To, you know, it's arbitrary in that sense, right? Mm -hmm. But but the you should decide one or the other and be consistent, right? Mm -hmm. And so. Um, What's important to see here is that Aristotle's philosophy is not true because it's useful in theology or because it's compatible with theology, but it's uh, compatible with theology or useful because it is true. And Descartes' philosophy is not false because it's incompatible with theology, because it contradicts theology and the faith, but it contradicts it because it's false. <laughs> the false contradicts the true, right? It's the, the, the true doesn't contradict the true, but the false contradicts the true. We'll see that better we get into what statements are for that contradictions, right? <clears throat> so notice what Thomas does, huh? Um, he divides into two, absolutely, or towards something, right? Mm -hmm. And then he subdivides the first into two, right? Mm -hmm. So he ends up with three, and so now we've got four out of right? Mm -hmm. Substance, quantity, quality, relation, right? Yeah. 
And he has a whole chapter to go to each of those four right now. But he's very brief in the last six. Let's look at the last six. Now, you can see that absolutely and towards something, that's a, you know, division very clearly by opposites, right? Because um, absolutely there means what? In itself, you know, as opposed to towards another. This here is a little hard to see, but you see it's better when we study matter and form and natural philosophy. But all material things are quantity. Body and body. And notice the word how here, right? See? It's just the word how. By the definition of difference, we said it signifies how it is, what it is, right? See, if you're talking about a difference up in, in substance, that would be in substance, right? Here you're talking about some accidental quality as opposed to substantial quality. What is, is that in Greek? How would they express that? How? Point us, I think. Point us. It says in, in Greek and Latin, there's a more connection there between the concrete way and the abstract way. In English, you have to say, how this? Qualis and qualitas, poios and poiotis. Now, in the last group, huh? something can be said. individual substances by reason of something outside of them. Now this is going to be eventually divided into six. But Thomas again arrives at the six by dividing into two or what? Three, right? Never see Thomas take the rule of two or three, but he seems to always, but <laughs> you know, I mean, for the most part, huh? and as I'll explain when you get to the rule of two or three, it's uh, uh, true only for the most part. And sometimes we immediately divide into more than three, right? But usually, if you divide into more than three, you're either what, dividing and subdividing and giving the results of several divisions, right? Mm -hmm. Or you're crisscrossing two divisions, right? If I divide human beings into good men, bad men, good women, bad women, clearly I'm crisscrossing good and bad, male and female, right? Mm -hmm. So to understand that, you have to go back to two, uh, divisions of two, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Or sometimes they say, order is compared to reason four ways. <laughs> but then you analyze it, and he has what? Two, and then one of them divided into three, right? Sometimes he just puts it together, right? Uh, I think it's in the uh, Perhemenius commentary where Aristotle sometimes he he uh, he'll define one thing, and then the next thing maybe has the same parts in his definition except for the last part. Just keep the last part. Mm -hmm. you know, seeking brevity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? It's like if I was you know to define um, now a genus is a name said with one meaning of many things other than kind signifying what it is. Huh? Why the difference signifies how it is what it is. Mm -hmm. I haven't given you the definition explicitly of difference, right? Mm -hmm. so, by just giving you the last you know, yeah. part. Huh? I think Aristotle does that visit now and verb you might do it, you know? Okay. So, <clears throat> better than Peter Self, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> now, Thomas usually divides this into two, right? He divides one of them against the other five. One of them is peculiar to man. Okay? So, common to man and other things, huh? And then private to man. Huh? 
not submitted a oversimplification to say private demand, um, but it doesn't belong to anything else except if it comes into the use of man. Huh? Now, in Greek, this is called um, exis, huh? in Latin it turns out habitus, right? Sometimes um, I take the liberty in English to say outfitted. <laughs> okay? Outfitted. But this may not be the best way to translate it. But it gives the idea there, right? An outfit, huh? An outfit is something that fits you outside of you, right? Huh? Okay. Um, Why does man have this, son? Huh? Why does man have this, son? Huh? Because uh, he needs it. It's not natural to him like animals. Like have a yeah, yeah. Uh, man was not given by nature everything he needs. Huh? And why was that so, right? The other animals have the tools they need for doing what they do mm -hmm. as a part of them, right? So the animal has its what? Claws that needs claws, right? Or it's got its sweat horns that it needs to butt other animals around, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Or it's got its wings that it needs to fly away, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mothers. Uh, it's got its stinger, you know. It's, you know. <laughs> they, they, they're, you know, they're just all red. <laughs> 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 I thought something like that. <laughs> all, all red. Okay. So they have these, you know, tools, you know, for building into you and <laughs> like, right? Um, why can't man have, uh, by nature, the tools he needs? Okay. Well, I've been digging in the ground, so I need a shovel this week, huh? And then there's these roots down there, so I need an axe to back away, right? Huh? Mm -hmm. And then I'm building out dirt, so I needed a, a rake, huh? Okay. And uh, then when I go in the house, I need a knife and a fork and a spoon, right? Huh? And uh, then I need a, a screwdriver, you know, because you're fixing up the fans and so on. <laughs> it's getting so hot, right? Huh? Mm -hmm. And then I need a key to get in my house and so on, get in my office, right? Mm -hmm. And then I guess I need a computer now. I can, <laughs> oh, and, and I need a car, right? And so on, uh, and a steering wheel and so on. Um, there's a kind of an infinity of things that, that man is able to do, right? And there's no end to the tools that he might what, require, right? Huh? This building's on fire, we need that fire extinguisher over there, right? Huh? Okay. So, um, he needs need a pen, obviously, right? Huh? Yeah. But can you imagine what it would be if I had the hammer and the saw and the axe? <laughs> Knife and fork and spoon and all these little tools, yeah, right? Sorry, like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So instead, man, nature's given man a hand, right? Whereby he can fashion other tools, right? And what? Use them, right? So the hand is sometimes said to be the tool of tools, right? Mm -hmm. The hand corresponds to what? To reason, right? There's something unlimited about reason, huh? When we look in natural philosophy at the fragment, the great fragment DK12 there, of of um, Anaxagoras in the mind. The first thing he says about it is it's unlimited, right? There's something infinite about the mind. Huh? Mm -hmm. and you see that from the universality and the universal mm -hmm. contains an infinity of things. But in the biological books, Aristotle says that Anaxagoras said that man is the most intelligent of animals because he has a what, hand instead of a hoof or a claw, right? Mm -hmm. Aristotle says, well, no, it's just the reverse of what he says. Because he's the most intelligent of animals, he has a hand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is the tool of uh, reason in a way, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Interesting that first act of reason is called simply grasping, even by all the name. Mm -hmm. okay. But the hand enables you to what? Make and pick up and use an infinity of different what? Tools. Tools, yeah. yeah. Okay. In the same way, man is not given by nature what? The clothing he needs, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the cat seemed to be shedding some of her. her mm -hmm. My neighbor's dog there, they had, you know, she's getting all tangled up anyway, so it was good for her, you know, to be <laughs> cuts of her fur, right? Mm -hmm. It's cooler, right now. Huh? Some people take a brush and they go to the water and they brush the cat, and the cats get to like it after a while, you know? <laughs> Usually they don't like water, but, you know. 
you know, and some cats get used to that, you know, mm-hmm. including the other, you know. You feel like pampering these cats, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know one of my favorite part of marketing, you went to one of these cat shows just to, you know, you're like, like, like the cat, you know, they hit cats around, you know, a little bit. You know, this kind of crazy, these cat shows, you know, people lay down, you know, they're taking care of these cats, you know, like these <laughs> fancy things, you know, more than most people take care of the children. <laughs> So, um, not only does man not have maybe the fur that he needs in the winter and so on, right? Huh? But also the fact that man doesn't want to uh, always wear the same thing, right? Now, you people have given up this <laughs> human quality, you wear the same thing every day. In fact, uh, men tend to do that, right? And they have the, same, <laughs> the same pants, the same shirt. And my wife says, You've had the same shirt and the pants on for a week now. And, uh, uh, <laughs> I change my suit at school about once a week, say, and then I, <laughs> but you know, we certainly do need different clothing, right? And especially a woman does, right? You know, these pairs of shoes. But even apart from that, I mean, uh, we do certainly need a different, you know, clothing, let's say, on, on the day of the wedding and graduation and different occasions, right? You see? So man, again, it shows something of that infinity of him, right? He needs different clothing for different occasions, right, huh? Mm-hmm. And different weathers, huh? So the other animals don't really have this unless they come into the service of man, like we put a, you know, saddle on a horse or something of that sort, right? Or sometimes, you know, they would, they would protect the horse, right, going into battle or something. Um, but this is the one that's private to man. Okay, so man is said to be shot with shoes or clothed or <coughs> armed, huh? They consider dangerous, huh? <laughs> But they're talking about this down here, right? Mm-hmm. He's our wicked city danger. So. He kind of used to give a public talk about this category here, right? Mm-hmm. It's just, it brings out something about man, the fact that this is man's mm-hmm. own right. category. Right. Okay. Right. And in, a, in a sense, I mean, you know, when the, uh, when the Pope and so on, you know, talk about the importance of, of priests and, and religious and so on, wearing their what? Their, their vestments, right? Huh? Yeah. It says something to people, right? Huh? It says something to the world and so on. So, I mean, this is important for man, right? Huh? Okay. And it's important, you know, for soldiers to have their own, what, particular thing, right? Huh? Mm-hmm. And it's really fitting that bride be decked out, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Check this as a pure like the spring, you know? <laughs> okay. Um, now, how does he distinguish the five common to man and other things, right? Okay. Well, he <coughs> says there are really two ways this takes place, right? Either by an extrinsic measure or by a Extrinsic cause or effect. Now, Thomas here is using his vast knowledge of natural philosophy here, right? In uh, talking about these things. In natural philosophy, when you get to the uh, third book of natural philosophy, the third book of natural theory, or the physics as well. In English. Uh, Aristotle talks about motion and place and what? Time, right? And place and time are the two what? Extrinsic measures, right? So either it's taken from place or from time. So not only am I clothed, but I am in the what? 21st century, right? Okay. And I am in what? Massachusetts. I am in this room, right? Huh? Okay. So you get from time, when, and from place, what? Where, right? Okay. I am said to be in Massachusetts, right? I am said to be in the 20th century, right? Now, 
<clears throat> There's another way we get something from place, huh? and that is from the order of parts in place. Huh? And this gives rise to um, what they call the Greek position. Order of parts in place. So I am what? Standing, right? Okay. I am what? Sitting, right? Okay. Now, my parts are arranged in place in a certain way, huh? Now, am I sitting? My body could be you uh, I used to work with one guy who um, again Thanksgiving, you know, he picked up a case of beer, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes he'd come to work and <laughs> I'd be up all night just drinking. But he didn't have any he didn't eat to excess, right? You know, he kinda of drank too much. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the uh, So, although, you know, one vice here might contribute to another one, right? They seem to be a little different, huh? Mm -hmm. One guy knew who drank too much. Uh, I said to him one day, which is better, a woman or a bottle? And he says, a bottle. <laughs> 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 well, you can see what his problem is, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, maybe temperance is not a lowest species. Uh, temperance, in general, is about, was, you know, pleasurable to the senses, especially you know, touch and, mm -hmm. and taste, uh, taste and kind of touch, but maybe it has, you know, different species, right? Huh? Mm -hmm. okay. And maybe courage is the lowest species, huh? At least the way Aristotle speaks of courage, huh? But it's limited, you know, to the battlefield on this, huh? okay. mm -hmm. That's kind of an interesting thing, because you might think as you, as you divide a genus, you know, finally you, you get down to the bottom and you get to a lowest species, that all those on the same level <coughs> would be lowest species. But is that so? Well, as I was mentioning there, you know, triangle, right? You divide triangle into equilateral, isosceles, and scalene, right? Equilateral, I think, is the lowest species. By isosceles, there could be different what? Kinds. Kinds, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you might have to get down to the ratio of the equal sides to the unequal side, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like two to one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and then that would have all the same shape, but at different sizes of the same shape, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe equilateral triangles are the lowest species, but not what? Yeah. And maybe um, squares are the lowest species, but not what? Oblong, right? Okay, do you see that? Um, that? That's kind of, you know, a surprise, right? Mm -hmm. That as you divide, if you don't reach the bottom, <laughs> um, all across the board, maybe. So if you divide animal into um, man and beast, <laughs> um, certainly man is maybe a lower species, but not beast, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> I mentioned how how um, when you divide. Uh, Plays of them are tragedy and comedy the lowest species. Huh? Well, it seems to me that there are really two kinds of comedy, which I call the good natured comedy, and then the what, satire, right? Huh? Mm -hmm. And I think the good natured comedy is a, is a more attractive, a better, more healthy <laughs> form of the life of right? But uh, you have to have a lot of experience of, of satire and good natured comedy before you'd be able to decide that there are really different kinds of comedy, right? Mm -hmm. okay. And um, if you take a, a tragedy like, like uh, Macbeth, let's say, and a tragedy like Othello, right? Well, Macbeth seems to, uh, to choose evil knowingly, right? Mm -hmm. in, in a way that Othello doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so there are King Lear and so on, right? 
So they really tragedies in exactly the same sense. Huh? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um, the logician is going to leave to the student of drama, right? To the student of comedy to decide when you've come to a lower species, right? And to the zoologist, when you get to a lower species, is it a dog or is it golden retriever or something, <laughs> right? Um, in the same way with, with plants, right? I'm, I'm a tea drinker and I, you know, I'm not sure if one kind of tea plant with you or not. <laughs> um, there's a major thing. Okay. Um, so there are definitely lowest species, right? But um, now it's clear when you've come to a lowest species, to what? Know a great deal about a subject, right? Mm-hmm. Aristotle and the Greeks, you know, they, they divide government into you know, monarchy and oligarchy and democracy and so on. But is there really only one kind of oligarchy? Huh? And you know, if you compare the American government to the British government, at least, you know, there's some differences there everybody knows about between parliament and prime minister. And, you know, you see it on the TV, you know, mm-hmm. it's kind of funny to watch it <laughs> because the, the uh, producer comes in and, mm-hmm. and everybody wants to ask a question, right? And, uh-huh. uh, and it's kind of like back and forth, right. kind of good natured, you know, kind of mm-hmm. kidding each other, right? Huh? Mm-hmm. And these guys get very what, quick on their feet, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I always take the example there of that uh, Wilson, I think, was prime minister. Mm-hmm. But, you know, mm-hmm. I tell the story, he was, he was at a, some kind of rally, he was speaking, you know, some guy there was yelling, Garbage, did I tell you that story? <laughs> and how do you handle that, right? You know, mm. you know, you're giving a speech. <laughs> you get some a stripper's guy saying, garbage, about every you know. Well, he, he turned to the guy and says, I'll come to your specialty in a moment, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Shut him up, right? Now, I don't know how to handle it. I, you know, probably be talking louder or quicker or hey, 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 something, hey. right? <laughs> and and reading my speech, see? Huh? But he knows how just to say it. I'll come to your specialty in a moment, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and he had it so quick, you know, that he's a bit of a fun watch. <laughs> um, uh, one time in Brahma there where, where Churchill was speaking, see, and uh, he was being opposed by a lot of people writing his ideas, right? Uh, and finally says, um, but he says, I'm not going to cast my pearls, and everybody's expecting him to say, <laughs> And the whole, the whole part is froze. You know? uh-huh. He says, "Before those who don't want them," he says. No, 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 no. It's you know, you know. So, <clears throat> so I mean, is the American form of government and the and the British form of government really different kinds of government? Huh? You know, it's a little bit. Obscurity, right? Huh? Yeah. <clears throat> Aristotle speaks, you know, of the best government for most men, considering the virtue that most men are capable of, as being middle class government, right? And in a way, American government has been that to some extent, huh? mm-hmm. but it kind of swings a little bit, you know. Mm-hmm. Towards the oligarchic and then towards the democratic, and then, mm-hmm. but never completely gets some balance, you know. Mm-hmm. So those things are not as clear. So we leave maybe the political philosopher to say whether the British government, American government, differ only accidentally, right? Whether well, it's an essential difference, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. But there certainly are lower species, right? Mm-hmm. But um, and in a sense, if there weren't, how would you ever get to the individuals? <laughs> But they say it's not always clear when you've come to a lowest species, when you've come to a species that is still a genus. Huh? But the reverse is the question the logician is going to answer more universally, right? Is every genus have a genus before it? Huh? Well, if that were so, would you ever really know anything? Because I have to know what a quadrilateral is, what it is to be foresighted, 
before I can know what a square is, right? And if quadrilateral is a rectilineal plane figure, it's another genus we don't have a name for, right? I have to know what it is to be contained by straight lines before I can know what it is to be contained by four as opposed to three or five or six and so on, right? So you have to know the genus before you can know the species. So if every genus had a genus before it, you'd have to know an infinity of things before you could know what? Anything. You wouldn't know anything, right? Is that true? You don't know anything? Mm-hmm. Even the man who says we don't know anything, he claims to know that we don't know anything, and therefore he claims to know what knowing is, right? Mm-hmm. And he couldn't know what that is, according to his position, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, again, could you ever come to know anything by definition? Because you have to define quadrilateral. Mm-hmm. Say before you define square like it does. Mm-hmm. And you have to define rectilineal plane figure before quadrilateral, right? Mm-hmm. And there'd be an infinity of definitions in this case, right? Mm-hmm. Before any definition, so we would never know anything by definition. And yet we all know we've come to know what an odd number is, what an even number is, and even what a perfect number is, and what a square is, and what an oblong is, by definition, right? Mm-hmm. And what uh Blank verses, right? <laughs> I came to know that by definition, but you would never come to know anything by definition if every genus had a genus above it. There'd be an infinity of definitions, we suppose. Yeah. This is very much like the argument in the logic of the third act, huh? that not every statement is what? A conclusion, right? Not every premise is a conclusion. Many premises are, maybe most are, right? But many but not every premise is a conclusion. Otherwise, you have an infinity of mm. things before us. You couldn't even begin to know anything, right? Now, there's also an argument that you can give that's peculiar to the genus, and that is that the genus is always said of more than the species, right? So if every genus had a genus before, or a genus above it, huh? um, then there'd always be a name set of more than any word or name, right? Mm-hmm. And in that case, you'd never come to a most universal name, would you? Mm-hmm. Would you? Mm-hmm. But do we come to most universal words or names? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And examples of those, the most best examples would be words like being or thing or something can there be something that is not a being can there be something that's not a being no it, being is it's even the word to be itself right mm-hmm. okay. so whatever is in any way whatsoever right is a being right so can there be anything anywhere that isn't a being no so there's nothing more universal than being, is there? Okay. Can there be something that isn't something? No. No. See? Yeah. There'd be nothing, right? <laughs> nothing that isn't something, right? So something is completely universal, right? Okay. So you never come to most universal names if every genus had a genus above it. Mm-hmm. If every genus had a genus above it, there'd always be a more universal name than any name. Or any word, right? <clears throat> now, the fact that you come, though, to these most universal names is a sign that there must be a highest genus, right? But it doesn't really tell you whether there's one or more than one, right? And someone might add, say, if you have these most universal names, do you have one genus of everything? <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Well, now you can see the importance of, of uh, knowing definitions, right? Huh? If the word being or thing was said of everything, inevitably, mm-hmm. 
That is to say, with one meaning in mind, right? Mm -hmm. Many exactly the same thing, like quadrilateral means exactly the same thing instead of square and oblong and rhombus and rhomboids. Uh, then you would have one genus of all things, right? But if being or thing is not said with one meaning of everything, right? Then you don't have one genus of all things, right? Now, Plato is somewhat anticipatory, but mainly Aristotle, who saw that the word being and the word thing are equivocal, huh? Mm-hmm. And they're easy to go out and find out they're equivocal by reason, but nevertheless they're equivocal. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> take a very simple example um, to manifest this. Um, this example I always use. Suppose you have a man and a dog in a room, nothing else, right? We'd say we have two things in the room, right? Mm-hmm. A man and a dog, right? Now you take the dog out of the room, right? And you're left with one thing, right? Mm-hmm. Now suppose someone came back and says, no, you've got two things in there. you got the man, and you have the shape of the man. Or you have the man and the health of the man. Are they the same thing, the man and his shape? No. No. Sometimes his shape changes, right? Mm-hmm. Like just size and time. <laughs> <laughs> and is a man and his health the same thing? No. no. But now, are the man and his health two things, like the man and the dog are two things? No. no. At first you wouldn't think of them as being two things, would you? Mm-hmm. Okay. Because the health of the man, or the shape of the man, is something of the man, right? Mm-hmm. But the dog is really what? Another thing, right? It's nothing of the man, huh? Okay. And yet you wouldn't want to say that the health of the man is nothing, that when a man is concerned about his health or a woman is concerned about her shape, that they're concerned about nothing, right? Mm-hmm. Or if you took the, the, you know, you take the working man, right? Huh? And you say to him, now, is my nose and my ear the same thing? What would he say? No. Two different things, right? Okay. How about my nose and the shape of my nose? Are they two things too? What do you say probably at first? First inclination, yes, but right. or it'd be no. no. It'd be more no. Oh, yeah. 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 But if he doesn't admit that they're two things, we'd say, Well, want me to flatten your nose? Yeah. Huh? You know? Oh yeah. <laughs> There's a difference between the nose and its shape, right? Huh? But the nose and its shape don't seem to be two things like the nose and the ear are, do they? No. See? The nose and the ear are more like the, the man and the dog, right? Okay. Well, this is the distinction the philosopher makes between what we call a substance, right? Like a man or a dog, and an accident, like the health of the man or the shape of the man. Okay? Um, so, is a substance an accident? thing in the same sense? No. No. Um, Now, man gets up on the stage and he says, to be or not to be? That is the question, right? What's he thinking about? Primary sense. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking of suicide, right? <laughs> Hamlet there, right? Huh? Going on living or not, right? Huh? Right? Yeah. To be or not to be, that is the question. Huh? That's been said on the stage for centuries now, right? And people understand that to refer to his living, going on living or dying, right? Okay. Um, now, if he had meant, you know, to be married, to Ophelia or not to be married to Ophelia, right? <laughs> or to be a student or not to be a student, you'd have to what? Qualify. Qualify it, yeah. If you just use the word to be, period, 
we're going to think of his substantial being, his very life, right? Huh? Okay. If I say to the student now, if you leave this room, you will cease to be. That sounds like a what? Threat, threat right? No? <laughs> okay. Now in this uh, uh, litigants society, right? <laughs> you know, they charge me as threatening the student, right? <laughs> I said, I say to the judge, well, I meant, Your Honor, that if so and so left the room, he would cease to be in the room. <laughs> Yeah. Well, nobody would have understood that, what you said, Mr. Berkman. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you'll cease to be. That sounds like a threat on your life, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. In other words, when you say to be without qualifying it, right, you think of substantial being. Mm -hmm. In the case of a man, his very life, right? Okay. Um, if you ask me, when did I come to be, right? I was born on January 18th, 1936, but I guess I came to be somewhat before that time, right? Mm -hmm. The year 1935, right? Huh? My mother's womb, right? I came to be. Um, I wouldn't talk about when I came to be in Massachusetts or when I came to be at the monastery, right? You know? If you wanted to know when I came to be in Massachusetts or when I came to be uh, at the monastery here, you'd have to add Massachusetts and the monastery, right? If you said, would you come to me, Mr. Perkwist? Yeah. You know? okay. In the same way, if you say, when, why, cease to be, I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, then you ask me when I'm going to die, right? Huh? Okay. I notice with the univocal word, right? You don't think of one necessarily before the other, right? If I say, for example, we have a pet at home, right? Okay, we have an animal. <laughs> Do you think of dog before cat, or cat before dog, or bird before, you know? See? Because it said equally of those, right? Okay. I got a habit. Do you think of it as a good or a bad thing? Could be a good or a bad habit, right? You know? Because they're equally a habit, right? Okay. But to die and to leave this room is not to cease to be equally, is it? <laughs> so he says to be or not to be, he's using being in the sense of life or death, right? Substantial being, right? So obviously the word being and the word thing are not said univocally, uh, substance and uh, what, accident, right? Okay. So, although there is, therefore, one word, which would be being, or a thing, or even something, although there is one word said of all things, it's not said with one meaning of all things, right? Mm -hmm. Therefore, it doesn't fit the definition of what? Genus, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And if you were to call being or thing a genus, you'd use the word genus in another sense, right? mm -hmm. not in the sense in which we first defined it, right? But sometimes we do use the word in that looser sense, but but in the strict sense of genius, um, uh, being or thing or something is not. So this leaves us now with the conclusion that there's um, more than one highest but genius, right? The fact that there are most universal names shows that there's not always a more universal name. And there always had to be a more universal name if every genus had a genus, because the genus is always said of more than the species. Okay. So you never come to a most universal name, but you do come to a most universal name. Therefore, there must be, you know, not every genus is a species, right? Okay. But then is it one or many, right? Well, then you examine these words that are said of all things, and you see they're not said of all things inevitably, but with one meaning. And therefore, there's got to be more than one, what? To my genius. Now, the first book that has come down to us from Aristotle, who's called historically the father of logic, right? The first book in logic that's come down to us, the categories, is about the what, highest genera. Mm -hmm. the, and I can say the highest genera, what do you mean by highest genera? The genera, that's a plural genus, obviously, that have 
no genus above them, right? Mm -hmm. The highest genus is a genus that has no genus above it. Or you could also describe it as a genus that is not a what? Species. Okay. Okay. He's like the first father. <laughs> if he's Adam, let's say, right? You could say he's a father who doesn't have a father, right? Or he's a father who is not a what? Son, right? Just like you could say the first cause, huh? It's a cause that doesn't have a cause. Or it's a cause that is not a what? An effect, yeah. Mm -hmm. See, those are ways of speaking, but you the same thing here. Um, so the highest genera are genera that are not species, right? And they're not, they don't have the just above them. Same way of <laughs> speaking, right? Okay. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> how should the highest genera be distinguished? That's the question. And see, we spend you know a whole semester talking about Aristotle's book, the categories. Huh? But how do you think Aristotle <clears throat> distinguished these? But in, in general, how do you think it goes about distinguishing the highest genera? That's kind of an interesting question, right? Then so we got to, we got down to the point now where we say that there are many, meaning meaning what? More than one, right? Mm -hmm. but there are many highest genera. There are many genera that are not species of any genus, right? There are many genera that have no genus above them, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. But how would you go about distinguishing these? <coughs> One way might be to try to examine the meanings of those most universal terms. Well, inductively, you mean, uh, or what? Yeah, because, well, like you were saying, that being or something <coughs> is different when it's said of substance or accident. Then you'd say, well, is it, is it said you never could have substance? Okay. Notice that. Kind of interesting thing here, right? If you look at this in terms also of what's gone before, right? Um, we're, we're looking for a distinction that is both a distinction of many kinds of things, because the genus is like, signifying a general kind of thing, like a species is a name of a particular kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. We're going to be distinguishing a number of kinds of things, right? And at the same time, we're going to be distinguishing meanings of the word what? Being or thing, yeah? That's kind of interesting that those two should come together. Now I'm going to contrast that. Huh? When I distinguish, or now when I don't, but when Euclid distinguishes quadrilateral into square, and you've done this right, okay. mm -hmm. into square and oblong and rhombus and rhomboid and um, trapezium, right? Huh? And later on we find out these first four are parallelograms, right? Huh? But doesn't know enough at that point to know they're parallelograms. <laughs> or the doctrine about parallelogram comes up later on in the first book. Okay. Um, he's distinguished four or five kinds, actually. There are five kinds of quadrilateral, right? Has he distinguished five meanings of the word quadrilateral? Asking everybody. Kind, kind. See? You distinguished, you know, square, oblong, rhombus, rhomboid, trapezium. You distinguished five kinds of of uh, quadrilateral. Mm -hmm. Or if you just take the first four, you distinguish four kinds of parallelogram. Okay. 
But in the case, have you distinguished five senses of quadrilateral? Or in the other case, have you distinguished four senses of parallelogram? Or take another example here. Huh? Um, when I distinguish between odd number and even number, right? Two kinds of number, right? Are these two senses or meanings of the word number? This is something, you know, that is kind of a subtle difference here. Huh? It doesn't seem. No, no. An odd number, an even number, is a number in exactly the same sense. Mm -hmm. A multitude composed of units, as Euclid says, or a multitude measured by the unit, as Aristotle says sometimes. Okay? And likewise with quadrilateral, right? A square and a oblong and so on, mm -hmm. each of these is a quadrilateral in exactly the same sense. Mm -hmm. It's a plain figure contained by four straight lines. Tragedy and comedy. The different kinds of drama, right? Yes. Yeah. Are they two different meanings? of the word drama? Okay. But notice, the word being, or the word thing, or the word something, uh, those words are equivocal. It's going to have many senses, right? And when we distinguish those many senses, we are going to be at the same time distinguishing many kinds of things, right? So at the same time, we have a distinction here of uh, many kinds and of many, what? Senses. And you shall think in. I can think about that this year when I was thinking again about the distinction Aristotle makes that we'll, we'll meet in philosophy of nature between four kinds of causes, right? Matter, form, mover, and end. And uh, he distinguishes these four kinds of cause, but at the same time, he's distinguishing four meanings of the word, what? Cause. cause. Interesting. So look, take the word, the word seeing there, right? Huh? You know? I distinguish between the act of the eye and imagining and understanding, right? Huh? These are three meanings of the word to see, right? My mother used to always say, you know, I see, said the blind man, but he couldn't see at all. I know why she thought this was clever, but she always <laughs> repeated it to me, right? Okay. It always comes back to me, right? Okay, there's a kind of a play there of the two meanings of the word to see, right? Huh? But could you also say that these are three kinds of seeing? Take, take King Lear, right? In the, in the famous play there, right? You know how, not King Lear, but uh, what's the father's name? The other father. Gloucester, right? Okay, you know Gloucester gets blinded, right? And he, through the evil too, right? You know, you know right? yeah. King Lear, huh? What? I heard that one. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, he begins to understand after he's been blind, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's seeing now in a what? In a way. Yeah, in a way he'd never seen before, right? In a much better way, right? Mm -hmm. Another kind of seeing, right? Mm -hmm. See, at least two different kinds of seeing. As well as being three senses of the word to see. Yeah? If you see me now, right, with your eyes, right, okay, and I go home and remember me, picture me in your imagination, right, you remember, right, um, you know, seeing me again, right, but different kind of seeing, huh? 
drinks when I sit. <laughs> it's not hard to say, isn't it? <laughs> mm -hmm. I see what you mean, Mr. Perkins. <laughs> So, how would one go about distinguishing these highest genera? See, what, what comes to mind at first um, and we saw this already when we were pointing out that the word being or thing didn't mean what have one meaning, right? Mm -hmm. What we first began to see was that man and dog are a thing, are things in a different way than a man and his what? Hell, mm -hmm. right now. Okay. And this is the distinction that the philosopher makes between substance and what? Accident, right? And substance comes in the Latin word to what? Stand under, right? Huh? And accident comes from the Latin word to happen to something, right? Huh? Okay. So you can kind of see why we call man or dog a substance and the health or the shape of the man a what? Accident, right? Because the accidents happen to what? Substance, right? Aristotle, in his book called the Categories, he points out this distinction between substance and accident, right? Accident is something that exists in another, right? As in a subject, like health exists in my body, right? And you can't, it can't exist by itself, huh? okay? or my shape exists in me, right? Or my virtues, or my vices, huh? <laughs> exist in me, right? Huh? Okay. You can't put me here in one room and my health in the next room. Or me in this room and my shape in the next room. Or me in this room and my vices in the next room. That's nice you do that. Right? <laughs> you know? um, that's the way it is. But you can put me in this room and the dog in the next room, right? Okay. So the accident is something that exists in another and it's incapable of existing except in another as in a subject. Why the substance does not exist in another. Mm -hmm. okay. So man and dog would be examples of substance and maybe the tree, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the animal things. Um, but the shape of the man, the health of the man, and so on. Would be examples of accidents. Aristotle just crosses this with another division. And that is between the what? Universal, what is said of many, and the what? Individual or singular, right? Okay. Universal and then the singular. The individual. Okay. So that's going to give you a chart with how many members, huh? Four. Yeah. Now, um, what would be an example of a singular individual substance? Socrates. Socrates would be an example of this, right? Or champion, huh? Did you ever see Ginocchi's horse champion when I grew up with? Never, this horse champion. One time I met champion. I mean, it's a horse. Huh? He came to St. Paul on a kind of rodeo, right? And all kinds of things. But, mm -hmm. but, but at the end, you know, Junaki, you know, he got a champion. Mm -hmm. And he, he went around, you know, waving his head. Mm -hmm. you know, and the horse would sidestep like that. Uh -huh. Around the pole, mm -hmm. putting it on it until he goes to play the horse. But, and uh, <clears throat> so Socrates is an individual. Substance, right? Individual man. Mm -hmm. Champion is a what? Individual mm -hmm. horse, right? Mm -hmm. Lassie, maybe. There was a famous Lassie in the movies, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe that was Tin or something. Like that. Yeah, my time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But man, or dog here, would 
the examples of universal substance, right? Mm -hmm. You go even more universal, you go up to animal, right? So, okay. Now, examples of accidents, the ones you mentioned, were things like health, let's say, huh? a shape. But if you take the health of Socrates, right? Okay. The health of Socrates. Or the shape of champions, of course. Okay. The habit of Socrates, right? This would be an individual accident, right? Now. Okay. Now, the way our style distinguishes these, he says that. Um, <clears throat> some things are said of something, right? But they don't exist in something else, right? Like a man or a dog, right? Yeah. Other things, he says, exist in something, like the health of Socrates, or the shape of them, but they're not said of anything, right? Mm -hmm. Some things are both, what? exist in another, and they're said of another, and finally there are some things that are neither said of another, nor do they exist in another, right? Okay. So you have two negatives to describe the individual substance, right? Two affirmatives to describe this, one negative and one affirmative to describe this, and one here. Right? I remember, it's always, you know, kind of very crazy when you study Aristotle, but he, he takes up uh, these two first, then that, and then that. <laughs> and I think it's kind of clever what he does, right? Because um, you see the difference between what being said of another and existing another. You take something said of another, but not existing another, and something existing another, but not said of another. You can't do the same thing, can they? And then you combine the two, you realize you're combining two different things. Said of another and existing in another don't mean the same thing, right? And of course, affirmative is for active. <laughs> okay? So it distinguishes the four, right? Universal substance, universal accident, single so, so, so accident. Okay. So can you repeat that? Uh, man no, said of but not existing. Okay. Notice, when Aristotle enumerates these, right? He enumerates first. Um, universal substance and individual accident, right? Okay. Because universal substance, you say man and dog are said of something, right? Man is said of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, right? Oh, yeah. Dog, like the monkey. <laughs> Should be hard, right? Horse is said of champion, and, you know, okay. or righteous horse, whatever his name was, a female champion, right? But, but we would say man and dog are the sort of thing that exists in others in the subject, right? The health of Socrates exists in another, but it's not said of anything else, right? Then universal accident, these are the sort of things that exist in other, like health exists in the body, shape in the body, and so on, habit maybe in the soul. But they are said of another because universal, right? By Socrates, the champion, they are neither said of another, nor do they exist in another. If I remember right, Danny, he, he talks about parts of, of uh, a plot, right? It can be before something and not after something, or after something and not before. Or both before and after, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah they're like doing that in uh, kind of interesting. So, uh, you get this fundamental distinction, right? But as you'll point out in the chapter on substance and categories, everything else. Is said of individual substances, right? Or they what? 
Yeah. Existing neutral substance, right? So the way everything, the, the way the highest genera can be distinguished is by something that, in a way, everything has reference to. <laughs> and that's the what? Individual substances, right? Mm -hmm. Everything else is either said of them or eventually exists in them, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we can distinguish the highest genera by the way something can be what? said of individual substances. Okay. Now, that's where we're going to distinguish them. Huh? something can be set up, do you mean the way a name can be set up? In the beginning of our experience are the material ones. So the distinction or division of substance into material and immaterial is something that would come, what, later, right? Huh? And then we might divide the material into the uh, living and the non-living. And you might divide the living into the plant and the animal. You might divide the animal, following Shakespeare there, into the beast and man. Huh? So in case you want to know where you are, right? Mm -hmm. In the scheme of things, huh? you're in the genus substance, or what it is, as he calls this, because these are distinguished by the way something is said of individual substances. And so when something is said of individual substances like you and me, or your dog, or my cat, or something, and answer the question, what is it? You can end up with something in the genus of what? Substance, right? So what is Socrates? We could say he's a man, right? More generally, we can say Socrates is a what? Animal, right? More generally, he's a living body, right? More generally, he's a material substance or a body. And most generally, huh, he's a substance. Huh? So all the ones above are said of those below, signifying what they are. Huh? If you, you know, put the genus in there, right? Material substance, right? Living body, huh? plant, animal. Okay. So that's the first um, highest genus, substance. Huh? Now the second one, which Aristotle also devotes a chapter to, there he actually divides the second category into its immediate species. Huh? And the second category is how much or quantity to use the abstract word. Huh? And Aristotle divides quantity, which is like the measure of substance, he divides it into two kinds. And these are called discrete and Continuous. Now, the main kind of discrete quantity is what we call numbers. Huh? And the main kinds of continuous quantities are the line and the surface and body now in the sense of three dimensions. Huh? So, if you use the word body for a species of continuous, and we saw before, body is a species of substance, mm -hmm. the word is equivocal. And that equivocation deceives uh, Descartes and others, right? Who confuse uh, length, width, and depth with a substance <laughs> that is apt to have length, width, and depth. Uh. And as I was saying, if Descartes grew up, right, the substance, the man, remained, but the size, what, changed, uh, the quantity. 
Now, Aristotle distinguishes between the discrete and the continuous in one way in logic and in another way in natural philosophy. In logic, he defines the continuous as a quantity whose parts meet at a common boundary. So he says it's a quantity whose parts meet at a common boundary. Okay? Like in a straight line, for example. The left and the right side of the straight line meet at a point, huh? which could be considered the end of one part and the beginning of the what? Next part, right? In a surface, take the diagonal, one part meets the other part at a what? Line. Huh? And this line is the end of one part and the beginning of another part. Huh? Or let's say in a circle, you take the diameter. The left and the right side there, or top and below part, we're going to call, of the circle, they meet at a common boundary. This line is the end of one and the beginning of the other. And if I was to break this piece of chalk and talk about the right and the left side of the piece of chalk, they would meet at a, what, plane. Uh, time is also considered sometimes a continuous quantity. Huh? In the past and the future, come up to the now, right? And now, the sense of the end of the past and the beginning of the future. But a discrete quantity, like number, if you take the number three or the number five, the number seven, anyway, you take the parts of seven, let's say three and four. Do three and four meet somewhere? No, no. So the discrete quantity is a quantity whose parts do not meet. At a common boundary. And that's why it's called discrete, huh? as it were, separated. Huh? But continuous implies that the end of one is the beginning of a what? Another, right? Huh? So the boundary between the United States and, say, Canada, <coughs> kind of imaginary line there, it's the end of the United States and then the beginning of what? Canada, right? Now, in natural philosophy, Aristotle will give another definition of continuous. He'll recall this one, but he'll give another definition of continuous. And that is, the continuous is that which is divisible forever. Okay? And he'll show in the sixth book of natural philosophy that the continuous is divisible forever. But the discrete, the number, is not divisible forever. So if I divide 7 into 4 and 3, and I divide the 4 into two twos, and the twos into two ones, you can't really divide the 1, <laughs> unless you're talking about continuous quantity. But if you're talking about the 1 that's the beginning of number, that is actually simpler than the, what, point <laughs> in geometry. The Greeks used to speak of the point as a 1 or a unit having position, right? So if you can't divide the point, even more so you can't divide the one. So the discrete is not divisible forever. And if we ever get to <coughs> study the first book about the soul, Aristotle is proceeding dialectically. But he points out something interesting about our thoughts. That our thoughts are like numbers rather than like the continuous. We saw that huh? when you divide, say, the species into the genus and the difference, right? And sometimes the genus is a species, right? Mm -hmm. So it can be divided into another higher genus and difference. But it doesn't go on forever, does it? We show that there are highest genera, which quantity is one, right? So a discrete quantity is not divisible forever, and that's the way our thoughts are. They're not divisible forever. But the continuous huh, is divisible forever. That's a kind of sign huh, that thoughts are not continuous 
is a sign that um, our reason, the universal reason, is not material. Because everything material is what? Continuous. Sometimes. And even our thoughts about continuous things are not continuous. <laughs> and that's not explained by the fact that they're about the continuous. It's explained by the nature of our reason. It's one of the first places in the Dhyanima, there in the first book, where you get um, a reason for thinking that our universal reason that understands what things are is not in fact what a body, right? <laughs> that the brain in fact is not the organ of thought. Although it's related in some other way, we'll say, to thought when we study the three books about the soul. Motion, especially uh, local motion, is something continuous. Huh? So if I walk down the garden path, and that path is something continuous,